Well, it is 11 o'clock. We did it on time. Mark, how are you? I'm, I'm, I'm good. Okay. Are we going to be doing public radio announcements? <laughs> yes, we are. I, I, who's Alec Baldwin? <laughs> and uh, oh I really love your shreddy... No, anyway. So... <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't really work when it's two dudes. Well, I suppose it could, you know. <laughs> so you're good? Yeah, great. Great, great, great. You're hunk hunkered down in the studio, I see. Yeah, I, I had to cover all the windows up. It's a bright morning today. That's good, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's fun being in Los Angeles in, uh, I suppose, early March. So I suppose it's spring now, but it is funny that, you know, we had days in the last couple of months where you get out and it's like 75 degrees outside and you're like wait what happened isn't this yeah, supposed i don't to be think winter? we got much winter this year no not a lot not a lot although eric bought a electric heater wait there did i buy an electric heater um okay i bought an electric heater without realizing it but apparently i bought an electric heater and sometimes i walk in the studio and it's like whoa it's so hot in here and i'm like dude uh, aren't you latino aren't you supposed to be warm-blooded warm-blooded i see I'm trying to figure out why you would need a heater when you have an SSL. In you don't. Room. You don't. But yeah. But there was you actually fry an egg on that thing. Yeah. Uh, actually, no. The SSL it runs pretty. The four thousand runs really, really smoothly. It's the it's the Ne V and VR series. Oh, that, the V fifty one was the hottest console oh. over the VR I've ever been in front of. The fifty one. Oh my goodness. Absolutely crazy. So we have yeah. a a lot of wonderful people here. Hello, everybody. Um, if you haven't already subscribed, you know what to do. Please subscribe. Um, and of course you can hit the notification bell. I'm saying all the things that YouTubers say, Hey, why not? Um, and, uh, and please hit the like button. Cause then it lets, um, YouTube know that you like it and more people will come and watch it. Um, James says England is, is very bloody cold. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. Um, Tom says, we're on time. What's what, What's with that? I don't know. You have to thank Eric. He he managed to get here early enough to get it set up. God bless Eric. Eric! So um, feel free to ask questions in, of course, in the chat. That's what a live Q&A with Mark Daniel Nelson will be all about. Um, but Mark, I'm very excited. We're, put, we're putting out a course with you today or with Eric Burden, who's yeah. a rather rather wonderful uh, artiste, to say the least. I, gr I grew up listening to... Um, my dad had a compilation album from the mid-60s, and it had... Um, it had... Um, oh, Lord, please don't let me be misunderstood. Da -da -da -da. So I remember one of my earliest memories of, of anything that wasn't classical or jazz was hearing Eric Burden's voice, which, of course, is rather special. So please check out... Um, Mark's course, you can see it above there. Um, so let's get started with some stuff. How, how what have you been, uh, obviously with the, the, the old Dan Pemick, um, you haven't been doing much tracking, I imagine. Um, no. has your mix load been getting pretty massive? Cause I know you do a lot of film and TV stuff as well. Yeah. So actually I'm fine with the no tracking thing just cause other than drums, like and maybe a full orchestra, like, honestly, I, I, I gave up wanting to sit in a room at 2 a.m. recording guitar overdubs. So <laughs> I think for the, the mixing thing, this kind of happened at a pretty good time in the reality of things. You know, if I get too overwhelmed, you know, you go on a walk. But I think in general, there's two films and three albums and maybe a few like one off single stuff seems to happen a lot now people just want one song and they'll come back in a month for another song and stuff like that now what is that uh what is that little desk behind you that controller there can you tell us a little bit about that yeah that's an original d command that's what i thought um, yeah it's got cool wood sides so it tricks people that's yeah. the that's the kicker um but yeah, it still works great, even with Pro Tools 2020, whatever you want to call it. Uh, oh, so it still works with that? A hundred percent, yeah. Oh, didn't we have one of those? I thought it stopped working. Uh, on 
Yeah, it stopped working. And the thing is, the pa- actually, the power supply had gone on ours like three times. It was the third time it had gone. And we yeah. did a research on replacing the power supply, and it cost more than if you bought one used on eBay. The actual well, I can tell you that they were not cheap in the beginning, and not, luckily I didn't buy it uh, new. I right. got it in the last couple of years, and it was very affordable, and it worked great. and It looks great, and it it's definitely, you know, it's a it's a console looking thing, but it, I miss the old analog console for sure that you sitting in front of. Totally, some interesting questions coming in. Um, Sam Miller says, he says, what are your thoughts on legendary mixers? I think this is also tracking engineers. I think uh, Sam, um, who use little compression, such as Bruce Swedian and Alan Parsons. I love them. Absolutely. Million percent. Like my favorite of all favorites. Like I learned under Bill Schnee, who loves compression, but absolutely is the purest of all purists and Doug Sachs and, you know, that universe, Al. I think, honestly, if you know how to get your sounds, then you're going to get the bigger sound. For me, I wanted to influence my liking so my influence of music that I love growing up to. And some of that was dirty, distorted sounds and compressed sounds. And did I lose you? No, no, I, 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 I'm just showing you an action. Oh, <laughs> I'm like, is he not talking? <laughs> I'm talking. Yeah. yeah. So I think that and, and, and Warren, Warren was just amazing. And <laughs> no. no, huge fan of, you know, sad to hear about Bruce Swedeen. Um, you know, his whole compressions for kids thing is, you know, there's obviously when he's sitting behind, I think he literally said that while he's sitting in front of two LA two A's and three 1176s on his rack, he had to compress those records, had to a little bit. I mean, you, you got to a little bit here and there, but I think what he's meaning is this whole rule of sending compressors through everything is dangerous. But do and you, it just becomes lifeless. I, which I totally understand and agree. But I do think, um, I think these these uh, questions are sort of a little loaded because for Bruce and Alan and Bill and um, Jack and, and uh, uh, or, or Jay Messina and, you know, all of these incredible engineers that we admire. Remember, they were all working completely analog. So yeah. they weren't in the digital world. So it's sort of what works in digital and what works in analog. This is, you know, this has become the big kind of push and pull between the traditional guys and girls and, and the newer guys and girls that are coming up. There's a lot of wagging finger telling off the young kids that you, you shouldn't be doing this that, and the other. And vice versa. Well, they didn't used to compress. Well, they did because they put a tube mic up and it went into a mic pre with large transformers in it and probably was on the edge of driving. And that went on to a couple of compressors, maybe lightly, but then hit tape pretty hard or fairly hard, which also rounded out transients and added a little tiny bit of saturation. And then it went back through a console, which had line amps with big transformers. My point is like so much stuff was subtly And then added. hit tape at the, at the end. Yeah, and then hit tape at and the end. And then a third time in master. I mean, it's just like... Yeah. Yeah. So when people, I totally understand it's a great, great question, but it's not a fair comparison because if um, Bruce were making records and Alan were making records, it'd be interesting to talk to him about this. In a completely digital world, they would be adding all of, they'd be trying to find how to get that sound that they hear in their head. So they'd be adding things to it. And it might be compression. It might be emulations of tape and preamps and EQs and, you know, all kinds of stuff. Because we all know a dig- digital transient looks like this, you know, that's super spiky. And yet when you pull up, you know, the tapes of some of these albums we're talking about, everything's so smooth and beautiful because it went through all of this gear on the way in. So I totally understand. It's a great question, but it's not really like with like because they were getting different results. Um, Real quick, though, please to add to that. You know, Bill Schnee had a Brevera Records, his own label that he would do direct to disc 192 digital. And for that, he would not use EQs or compression as much as he could 
for that. And the key was to retain the transients. You know, a lot of these guys were ha- at that era were happy to go to digital because you were able to retain the transients. But being able to go backwards and taking it off for me and probably for Warren, we we like both worlds. We like the high fidelity yep. kind of sound that makes it bigger than life. But then you need the compression for the energy. And you need that for the grime and you need that for the power. Um, of course, when you're getting records at level volume now, you know, you can't. It's not possible to not use compression now to get it at a commercial volume. Yep. I agree. Um, James is saying, how's the acoustics with the windows? So I'm writing, there's curtains. Um, <laughs> They're okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Da, 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 da. Uh, there's a lot of good questions here. How do you how do you decide how to compress drums for flavor? Um, do you use them to get sort of more groovy or watery? These are lots of terminologies: more snappy and punchy, slow attack, fast release. I mean, how do you decide? I suppose you know, song by song, tempo by tempo. I think it's I'm I've said this a handful of times. I like to work on music in terms of what it reminds me of. So if I'm, if I got a song that reminds me of, let's say Counting Crows, August and everything after, or Counting Crows, Recovering the Satellite. Those are two separate, totally separate sounding records by a band that has the same style. Now the drummer was different and the producer was different. You got T-Bone Burnett and versus what, what was his name? Your friend that did Recovering Satellite? Brad. Yeah. So you got two totally technical yeah great totally totally different sounding records both amazing um when i get a project i kind of put in my head and i do this with reverbs and other things too i go what does it remind me of or what does it sound like i can influence a certain character so i I might hear the drum set of nirvana and go okay that is more clamped and it's going to have a specific type of reverb so for drums I think about that. And sometimes there's no compressor on the two bus. And usually that's a breathing, more relaxed thing, more fidelity thing, almost going back to the thriller drum set or something like that. And it needs a little more life. But then you get something that's tighter and punchier, you're going to need it. And I go through a couple different, I just, the Pulsar 1178, I don't want to plug too much, but that that thing has been, I've been using that the last two weeks and it's, Absolutely. We have to do, awesome. we're, we're going to do a review and a giveaway with it in the next week or two. I actually had planned to do it on release day. Um, they're very good friends of mine, the Pulsar guys. Yeah, they're great. Incredible. They're great guys. Yeah, two two French guys and an Italian. Sounds like, a, you know, two French guys and an Italian walk into a bar. No, they're, they're great guys. Uh, I, I, I talk to them a lot and they're really super smart. Um, and I was planning to do that, but unfortunately... Because of, uh, you know, family commitments and stuff, you, you, you know, Mark, I wasn't able to release it. But it's coming up soon for everybody. And you, do you have a preset in there just to have interest? He's wanting to do some, which I think is going to be on the next release because I had a couple things. So we were talking last week about it. But the biggest thing I love about that guy is it's got the kind of clipper in it. Yeah. So there's a... a uh, a section for the distortion elements you want to add. So there's like a tape compression sound, there's clipping, there's triode, all these elements that you can do for drum bus. I just like to use the clipping at the end after I do my seasoning, like little salt and pepper. Yeah. I like to put the clipper there because it's absolutely helping me from the final limiter. So I used to just have a fab filter on my drum bus sometimes, and I would just have that cutting off one or two dB of the top top transient stuff and with this guy i'm looking at it and seeing what it's doing and it's basically clipping that half db to a db of transient that i wanted gone before it hit the final brick wall anyway so there's some really cool things about that compressor i haven't heard on any other compressor um there is a lot a lot of really good questions here um, the one I did, I, I did like, um, he, he's posting a couple times. Do you have any preference on vocal chain? And I think m- when you're recording, but more, I think what they really want to know is like, do you have like a go-to mic for a guy or a girl? Is that like, or do you find you have something that works in both scenarios? If you just like. Yeah, I think, I, I think with 
I love my favorite mic, and I said this in a video. My favorite mic for vocals is U forty seven. Still is. Um, 251 is probably my favorite overall mic. Just beautiful, like holy grail. Wow, I love this mic. But the 47 is my favorite for vocals. Uh, for girls, I usually, if I had a C12, I would like that or something in the vein of that. But at the same time, I mean, there's so many options. Let's go backwards and talk about stuff without budgets. You know, I did a project where they had a Peloso or Peloso, what is it, Peluso? Peluso, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Peluso M49, and it sounded incredible yeah. over every vintage mic at Prairie Sun we had. And we had a 67 up, and a C12 up, and a 47 up, and stuff like that. And the Peluso M49, which was the artist's, sounded the best. So it just depends on the vocalist. Um, I'm just a huge fan of two mics as I've said a couple of times. No, totally. It's... Me me too. I, I um yesterday I I did some background vocals on a song we've got coming out maybe next week or the week after we did a a, a wonderful collaboration with an insane singer so stay tuned for that. And so I did some backgrounds, not a great singer, and I actually went on to the Lewitt the nine and I have a U47, I can see it over there. I have a U47, but I went on to the Lewitt um because I needed a certain tonality, um, I'm, I'm enjoying I'm enjoying the modern world where I um, uh, one mic can provide different results. I w I agree with you entirely. If you only had one mic for a vocal, can't really go wrong with the U47. Uh, it's going to be it. I think we use it ninety percent of the time, and then we go to the Lewitt the other ten percent, and then we have you know we're blessed. We have every mic you could think of. We have C12s and everything. Um, and we have a lot of the Palooza, which are fantastic. But the, the 47 is always a go-to. I often feel like, without waffling on too long, I often feel like there's certain things that become standards because we associate them with certain artists and records. And the 47, of course, is so many of our favorite albums that we like that sound. Um, yeah. Just in the same way a 57 on a guitar cab pretty much the sound of rock and roll it's most records the 57 on a ludwig superphonic snare always sounds like the best snare drum sound you've ever had go figure you know it's there's certain things it doesn't mean that we shouldn't experiment but i do agree with well, i'll tell saying. you what real fast before you jump on the next guy um i did a session with ken calais where i was engineering and he was producing and i put up a 47 and it was a girl singer and i thought it sounded great and he's like, put up an RE20. And I'm like, okay. I mean, I'm a fan of dynamics on vocals, but she had a really pretty voice and, it, you know, quiet. And I'm like, well, then we, okay. So we did, and it destroyed the, the, the U47. And it was just another instance of going, okay, you just, you can't always just go off. I like to use the same things over and over. I'm comfortable at doing that. But sometimes you you surprise yourself even by using things that you wouldn't usually go after. So just keep kind of experimenting. My whole mantra this week is music is supposed to be fun. I've said this like 10 times this week and um, cause there's a lot of negativity for some reason going around and music is supposed to be fun. Experiment, get crazy, do stuff that you wouldn't usually do. Just have fun. I agree entirely. So lots of great questions. Um, do, 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 do. Inglewood, yes, I did. Crazy enough. Was what about Inglewood? Is that where you grew up? No, he said, "Did I really have a tattoo of a telephone on the back of my arm?" <laughs> you did? <laughs> yeah, I did when I was nineteen <laughs> or twenty. Twenty, yeah, yeah, like twenty years ago. <laughs> um, Sam, another quick good question from Sam it says: Whenever I use compression on acoustics guitar and ukulele, I find it degrades the sound quality. Why not? If would you use compression on acoustic string instruments? I, I sort of have to agree with that. I'm I'm very like I love using compression on acoustic guitars and ukuleles and mandolins and stuff like that. But as soon as I hear it, I hate it. It's one of those things, and, and but then again, in a in a dense track, sometimes it's nice to have it kind of a little bit slammed because it brings some extra energy in there. I think Sam, 
you know, on a vocal acoustic, I'd probably, or limited amount of mu- instruments, I'd probably be, probably be looking at volume rides first before I'd look at compression. And then some of the artifacts I always hear is when it's a very, very dynamic signal hitting a compressor in a kind of arbitrary way. So if I go in there and draw in and, you know, gain, match it, whatever you want to call it, volume ride it, um, you know, and get it so it evenly hits the compressor, then I can control what I'm hearing a little bit more. But, yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, compression on acoustics is just song dependent, isn't it? Yeah. I'm a huge fan of trying to, as in digital, with with tape, acoustic guitars don't need to be compressed at all because what it's doing is it's shaving off all the transients. So when you're wanting to compress acoustic, it's probably because one, the mic technique made it sound a little more brittle. So it's being a little more spiky or the player is playing in a way that's not necessarily creating that. So you find ways, even trying like an L1, slight L1 limiter on acoustic guitar is gonna take the peaks off without really compressing. Cause I'm like Warren, I'm not a huge, huge fan of compression. And then sometimes if you use something like an LA-2A or that MJUC on the um, on the, the, the setting that looks like a old Collins limiter, very slow, tuggy at a half dB works really good. But like I would rather put like a tape saturator plug in on an acoustic guitar before really compressing because now if you're delivering in a full mix, I like to hear guitars, acoustics compressed. But usually if it's a songwriter thing, and that's the same with like hard painting acoustic when there's a vocal and just a vocal and acoustic guitar. I used to do that. And then I found that like it didn't connect right. So I used to kind of put it more in the center. Um, and that seems to kind of create a little more of like a performance aspect and it makes the peaks less aggressive. Um, Man, there's a lot of questions. A lot of great in. questions. I, actually, I saw this one. I think uh, Michael put this one up under the yesterday's video. Michael says, hi, hi guys. Mark, on your most recent video regarding the guitar delay automation with the H-Delay and Isotope Vinyl, how wet was the original guitar and, and how was it tracked? Was there any additional reverb in the box? Yeah, I saw that maybe an hour ago. I think the, I think there's a part in the video where I just show for a second the guitar but if i don't you guys have access to that multi-track from the automation video this was a thing hold on my air is going on this was a thing that i put out for todd kessler's automation video so you can actually listen to that it's the only electric guitar in it um so you can hear what was done to that track by itself now if you listen to it the reverb is fully wet and it's not going back into itself. It's just the feedback control on the MJ or on the uh, H delay. So it's it's doing an internal loop thing there, but I'm just automating the feedback and goosing it on the uh, guitar track. So there's no reverb, it's just a delay, but the way the delay is set up, which the preset is on the description of that video, I believe, that you can maybe almost make it sound like it's reverb, because it's amplifying all the noise, it's amplifying the reverb on the guitar, because I believe the guitar had a little bit of spring reverb, stuff like that. Did right. that answer that? No, it's really good. It's really good. I'm answering questions as well by email about the course. <laughs> Multitasking. <laughs> one of my acoustic guitar sound is never going, is ne- one of my favorite acoustic guitar sounds is never going back by Fleetwood Mac. That one just came in, but I just had to point it out because I do think that's one of the best acoustic guitar sounds ever. Yeah, that's a lab mic. It's What mic is it? It was a lab mic. Ken liked to put lab mics on acoustic guitar, so I'm pretty sure that was... So that's rumors. I'm pretty sure that was a lav, like a little. Oh, a lav, lav mic. mic. Lavalier mic. Lavalier yeah. mic. Oh, so yeah. that so that's what uh, that's exactly what. Um, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Lindsey Buckingham. No, 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 no. Um, James Taylor would do that as well. That's that's a yeah. lav mic. Yeah, that, that's a lav mic that was just. It's like a little Sony cheap lav mic, that just put, was was on there. Ah, so I didn't know that. That's incredible. I think so. Yeah. If you ask, I remember asking Ken a couple of years ago. I mean, I have the multi-tracks of rumors and 
you listen to it, it's very close. You shouldn't have said that. Sound. That's that's oh boy. That, that was like that's like waving candy in front of like you know a bunch of you know sugar fed kids. I'm like, what? I think the you thing, have the multi tracks for rumors. What? What? To it, what? What? We're trying to get away <laughs> from it now, but if you listen to it, it's it sounds like it because it sounds really kind of high focus. And that also that album was done on two separate tape machines at Sausalito. Right. You know, at the time they had they it was required that they had two machines rolling and one was called Jaws because it literally ate, I think it was a 3M machine, literally eight tape machine. And there's a story that Ken has about I don't remember what song on rumors, but the tape machine literally broke and totally ripped off an entire five or ten bars of the song. And you can hear it in the master where they did an edit and it's just like it's like a speed bump. Wow. Um, I'm, I just wonder, you know, inside of the Academy, whether we could privately one time maybe listen to them, you know. Sure. <laughs> Did you just say that? You said, sure. All the well, I'll bring Ken, too. We'll, we'll have a little... A listening party session. with Ken and listen yeah. to the tracks inside of the Academy. Hey, Academy members, did you hear that? <laughs> That's insane. I, I grew up on that album. Um, I sort of I don't want to I don't want to wish wish the years to speed up a little bit, but I'm hoping it can be like at least when it's like 2022. Won't that be what year was it? 76 or 77? I think yeah, one of those two. I can't remember if it was 76 or 77. Sorry, everybody, I'm not recalling it exactly, but that will be um, that will be uh, um, a nice anniversary. We should just do it anyway. Let's just do a video on the album uh, and get get Ken involved and all yeah, that kind of fun 100%. stuff. All right. I'm I'm considering it done. <laughs> I mean, I I got I was blessed to track in that room. Uh, it wasn't the original console though. Do you remember what console they were using? Original console was an API. Uh, I don't remember. I was just talking to Ken about this because somebody claims that they have it in Texas, and I I had to talk to the guy in Reverb for a bit. And Ken is because Ken took over the Sausalito record plan again which eventually we're going to do a cool little segment on that. So just yes, we are. for that. Um, and then Warren's going to have to go back to the past and have memories of that place when he did the frame. Oh my God. Yeah. Let's catching on fire. Oh yeah. 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 Let's, let's just say it's an incredible studio, but by the time I got to work there, not so much, maybe in Ken's day it was, but now Ken's going to rescue it. So God bless you, Ken. Yeah. What an upkeep. Um, do, 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 do. I'm reading through some great questions. Uh... So there's a lot of questions about this this 480 Music Club C uh, drum reverb. I probably get five emails a day. I try to send it out as many as I can. It sits on my desktop, literally, because I'm trying to give it out to as many people as can. Can you just can. send it to us and then we'll blast it? Maybe we'll do that. Maybe from, if you guys aren't, able to get it or i'm not responding it's not that just I'm just send it to it. eric just, and we'll blast it i think we'll do a blast where everyone gets it because it's just an impulse yeah so it it will be what it is yep we'll 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 craft an email from the man himself mark with the c and blast oh, it yeah. um okay i'm going through all of these questions here there's lots of really really good ones there's load loads of uh, conversation going on which is rather beautiful um, lots of people just talking about what they use. Um, somebody's asking, is that a J160E? It looks like it looks like it to me. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's a 68. Oh, it is? I have to come over and steal that. Borrow, borrow it. Steal, steal, borrow, borrow it. Yeah, it sounds exactly what you, what you think it, like a piece of firewood. Well, it's, I, I recorded uh, Augustana, um, Hey Now, and well, the whole album with the J160E. Yeah. It is one, it's, they play beautifully because it's got like a Les Paul neck. It's one of the best playing, worst sounding in the room acoustic guitars that records really well. Yeah, I was going to say, if you want a unbelievable, if everyone's like, how do you get that Beatles acoustic guitar, get the J160. Yeah, it's it really good. like a telephone coming out. Of, I mean, it's like, what the heck? <laughs> it's ridiculous to be yeah, honest. I was uh, it's because why is it because of the uh, the way that the the uh, the bracing is? Is that what it is? Well, it's 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 not it's not a solid top. It's a plywood top. 
So it's like, okay. a, it's like I wouldn't say it's a cheap guitar, don't get me wrong, but by Gibson standards, it's like a cheaper guitar. Um, and so it tends to be a little dead sounding, but that is beautiful when you put a mic in front of it because it doesn't boom. It doesn't go yeah. boom. Yeah, exactly. It's almost like the better, this is an overgeneralization and everybody will tell me I'm wrong, but my overgeneralization when it comes to recording acoustic guitars is the better and fatter and warmer and more beautiful an acoustic guitar feels in the room, the worse it's going to be to record. I mean, everybody loves strumming a J200. Try and record it. It's horrific. It's just or boom. Jumbo. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. So that, those kind of things. Um, I think somebody was asking earlier, I'm sorry, I think it was Mark Becker asked, if you use tape emulation plugins, do you have any favorites? You know, now, this week, I've been really using the SoftTube guy. It's really neat. I like all of them, to be honest. They're even going back to the Macy tape head. I think that one's really cool. Oh, and it's so good. Remember when that so came in? Good. It's just like, what is this thing? I need to get so his the number. Steve Massey, isn't it? We need to get his information. Yeah, he'd be a great guy. I mean, he was one of the first guys that were putting out really rock solid plugins in the beginning. Um, but so that guy's great. You know, the the Kramer tape is really unique because it's an Ampex guy. The two UAD suckers, the Studer and the ATR. I use ATR on my master. I use the Studer stuff. Depending, it's in my drum bus. It's engaged in my channels. Um, the slate's pretty good. Actually, I like that on acoustic guitar quite a bit and uh, what am i missing oh the acoustica i haven't put my head around the tapi or whatever they call that guy it's pretty good it's a little confusing because there's so many options you know they've got so many different model tape machines on it that you know it's it's not it's a little overwhelming i mean there's a lot of boxes out there and plugins that have so many controls that turns me the word turn me off is probably wrong, but gets me scared because it's just overwhelming. But to be honest, they're all pretty solid. I don't know if any of them really sound like tape, you know, in general, but they sound pretty, the ATR is pretty good. Yeah, I was talking, I was talking to, just just, just to sort of tail on to this, I was talking to um, our, our Pulsar friends, who are, say great guys, and I and they looked at one of, I'm not going to say what it is, one of the most popular transformer plugins and analyzed it and said, yeah, it's an amazing plugin. It's not transformer. It's just different variations of saturation. And, you, you know, it's just the, the reality is, is like, you, you know, a lot of these things are what's the right way of uh, are, um uh, what do you call it when you're stacking things up? Like one, we end up using tape plugins, transformer plugins in a way that was very different from the way they were usually used because it was a combination of maybe 10 things in a chain that gave us that sound. So we're trying to get a plug in to get the whole sound of a classic record. I'm just going to put this tape plug in on it. Well, it's like, as Mark was saying, when you need the tape going in, you need the tape going out when it's mixed. You need at least, I don't know, eight transformers in the way because you have a transformer in the mic, probably right. with the tube in the mic going into a, you know, into a, uh, um, a, a compressor, which had a couple of transformers, input and output transformers, input and output transformer on the mic pre, you know, and then... Then that's maybe that's then that's coming back down the console with a line amp with a transformer and a transformer on the output stage, bounce to tape, uh, Poltex transformers tubes. I mean, and then we're going which plugin's going to sound like that? You, you know what I mean? We've got to we've got to cut ourselves some slack here in a digital world that um, you know you're not going to get that exact same sound unless you carefully reconstruct everything exactly because it wasn't just the magic of tape we all love tape i have an a80 you have what's that up behind you is that oh, TX? That's just an akai yeah oh it's an akai it's a quad you know we all love that but it can't just be solved with one of the pieces but it definitely helps i like the massey a lot i've forgotten about that because um, but they were fantastic they stopped supporting other daws other than pro tools still a big really? fan yeah, unfortunately, I think I think he supports a couple of ones, but I don't I don't think he has a VST anymore. We'll have to hit him up, and then. Um, uh, but Mark Ender swears by it, loves the Massey, um, and then um, I still I still use Mac DSP Analog Channel. You like that? I actually have never used much 
at TSP, maybe a bit in Chicago at CRC when I was doing stuff there, they had a lot of that there. So I would use it here and there, but. I think for your sensibilities, you like it because it's, it's definitely yeah, feels that. more like a, I'm yeah. being asked if I still record to tape a lot. I still record to tape occasionally. I don't do it a lot. So I'm thinking about doing an episode. There's a guy, he's a wonderful guy named Matt, who's um, on the East Coast that refurbishes. He's a retired Navy guy. And he refurbishes old tape machines. That's his whole universe. I saw this random thing where he has this like shop with like 40 and a lot of them's prosumer tape machines. They're not all, you know, super big multi-tracks. And it got to me thinking that like, for me, like I have a super digital chain. My conversion's ridiculous. Every, you know, with everyone, it's like quality is really great. Why would someone in 2021 want a tape machine? They usually want it because they're wanting to color it and make things sound worse. And so I go, man, I think I want to get a Tascan 388, which is that original eight track giant Porta studio that it made it's a reel to reel just because I wanted to have options to maybe do some serious damage to things that I can't do. I mean, I have this guy, which is, Oh this yeah. This is the, this is the original <laughs> Mark Daniel Nelson <laughs> recorder that I had. This is how I started going up on reverb for $27,000 being, what's, what's that company in England that sells everything at 10 times their price? <laughs> oh yeah. This, you know, I don't know if you can read what this says. Oh, oh it did. It just autofocus. Uh, it says John Lennon bootleg. <laughs> I don't even, so this is the original thing. I run a lot of stuff through it because it does something really cool that you can't do in uh, digital. So I'm thinking, you know, it'd be really neat is to have like a real cool setup, like a 388 or something to be able to do just transfer stuff in it, mangle it up. Because honestly, if you want tape, you are going to want it to make it sound a little less pretty, you know, you don't want it because you're looking for fidelity. I had an ATR in my room for two years and I never turned it on because it was so good and trans like everything was so good sounding that it was very far. It wasn't far enough off from digital print. And um, that's my thing. If you're going to use tape, you might as well go crazy. I mean, I had an MCI two inch for years and I on purpose always kept it at 15 IPS and I didn't like noise reduction or anything like that because I wanted the effect of tape. If you're going to go for the effect, go for the tape. Um, so Levi has asked this question a couple of times. Sorry for uh, we didn't get to it earlier. Um, I'm going to use the bathroom and throw Mark under the bus on this one. Okay. Uh, what kind of reverb do you like to use on rap vocals, Mark? Longer decay time, shorter de decay time. I found I like a short decay plate or room reverb what do you think yeah so hip-hop is ever-changing trends and i'm going to continue going on this guy because we have a bathroom break here so my background i was an assistant on rap sessions and hip-hop sessions before any other projects i was an intern at a studio that did multitude of every style of music in chicago that studio was called the Chicago Recording Company. It was an amazing big studio, had multiple different types of productions happening, large giant jingle sessions that were big orchestra stuff, all the way down to nighttime hip hop sessions. And a lot of large names came through that did a lot of the hip hop albums there. In the early 2000s, reverb at the time, you wouldn't use a lot. You would just not do, a, there would be delay and stuff. And that goes into the mid 2000s, where people started using a little more reverb on hip hop and uh, rap. For me, if you're talking hip hop, like original great kind of hip hop, there is kind of lo-fi hip hop. You would use kind of plate reverbs and kind of dirtier reverbs because it's like underground hip hop, stuff like that. If you're doing kind of traditional, normal, modern hip hop and rap, if you're using a long reverb, it's only for an effect for a shoot. And you're right, like something smaller, like the EMT 250 by Universal Audio 
is a fantastic reverb when you start bringing it down almost to the nonlinear setting where it's almost like a room setting. That will give it a just enough for even the D verb in Pro Tools is pretty ridiculous when you click into the non-lin because it's just this really, really short, uh, grainy kind of reverb. And when you need the big, long extension, it will shoot off and become this really great, unique depth that you're creating by creating this large reverb. I would end up using a little bit larger reverb on certain projects because if you are kind of creating a motion, sometimes the bass is so thick, you want to add a little bigger reverb because when you're going for low end and rap and hip hop, you want the bass and the drums to be the biggest part. So if you have a medium or a smaller reverb on the vocal, it actually loses the punch of the drums and the bass. So think about it like that. So it's either a little bit bigger or a little smaller, but medium is kind of dangerous for, at least for my approach, because it takes away of the drums and bass, makes it sound less punchy. Um, Aslan asked this cup, uh, question a couple of times, so let's uh, ask it. Do you uh, notice any significant difference in placing reference speakers either vertically or horizontally? Yes. So I had years ago, I had the Focal Twins. And when I got them, they were like this, horizontal. And I liked them. And I wasn't getting an image thing that I wanted out of them. I just came back from being spoiled in a listening environment and trying to get the best I could at the time financially where I was at. And so the twins were okay. And then one day, uh, my right-hand man, my assistant, whatever you want to call him, my best pal, Ryan Herma, who was my guy at the time, was like, maybe try him up and down. So we actually twisted him and put him vertical. And what that did was it completely changed the image. What I also did was at the time on my meter bridge of my console, we had the, the speakers and this, the one speaker. Uh, TV monitor to, to look at Pro Tools. And I didn't like the way that the, the, the monitor was coming in the same atmosphere, the same playing field as the tweeters of the speakers. So I, we moved the, the monitor just back four inches and it actually helped the center of the image. Going back to the vertical speakers, you know, I don't know if there's a huge difference between NS10s going vertical versus horizontal. Because at CRC, we had NS10s and we had the 1030 Genelex. And the 1030 Genelex, you would only do them vertical. But the NS10s, half the time, they would be the way you see them in classic pictures, which is horizontal. And then the other way is up and down, which just honestly just looks like you walked into somebody's living room and they're just, they took the speakers and put them up like that. But I do think, depending on the speakers, the way that the three ways of a focal is, and I think your trios back there are similar, or do you not have your trios up? Uh, I've got my uh, Trio 11s up, yep. Yeah. yeah, the trios are three ways, right? Yeah, but they've designed them, if you're talking about the ones where they have two drivers on either side and a tweeter in the middle, this has the driver on the outside, and right. people ask me about this all the time. That's exactly how they recommend it the bit main driver on the outside and then uh, uh, the beryllium tweeter with the mid range driver underneath yeah, um, the on the inside. Are, the, the sub and the, the, the mid range driver of the three way are the same size speaker. And I know that if you turn it, you're going to get a little bit different. Well, these are the trio 11. So they're actually a smaller speaker. Um, no, no, I understand that. I'm saying the difference because I had the trios before I had the ATCs yeah, and yeah. they sounded really weird. The, the twins though, like if you change them, they will sonically change difference. And sometimes you can yep. fix phase issues just by changing your speaker. So yeah, experiment. Yeah, definitely. Um, so Stuart McLeish is asking about console emulation plugins. Um, if you use them, and if you do, are you just thinking about them like a console? You're putting them on every single channel, or are you just choosing things to use them on? You know, I had 
a couple of years, and I was just actually talking to Eric about this a little bit ago, you know, I was in and out. We talked about this the other day, Warren, where it was summing. I was, I had a console. Then I started trying out all these different summing mixers, including everything under the sun. I had a custom API summing mixer that had 24 channels of 25, 20 op amps and transformers of real, real API guts. And then I went completely in the box after knowing that I had to go into it. During that time, I kind of tried certain console emulations. Since then, I've tried the, the Waves guy, Slate, Sky, uh, Luna, uh, UAD's interpretation of what it's doing. I know that Plugin Alliance has something now. They're all cool. They all add color. In fact, yesterday I was watching a random video of somebody doing an AB between the Waves and uh, Slate and then the Dangerous L2, which was, a, or LT, which I believe was the original two bus. And my favorite of all those was over the analog summing of the dangerous was the actual waves console emulation. The NLS, whatever it's called. Yeah, the yeah. NLS. Yeah. What I know it's doing that I don't gel with, that I, I'm sure a lot of people gel with, is I'm hearing some weird cross talking on the top frequency of the transients. So if you hear the air of the snares and stuff, the snare, like stuff like that starts getting funny sounding to me that I know what it's trying to do, but it's not doing what a real console does. And that's not why I chose that. But take that back. I've used it on separate channels and drive the snot out of it all the time because it really does do things uniquely. It's just dangerous sometimes if you put it on every, over across everything and you can't use mic knobs and stuff like that to make it actually sound clean. I'm a big fan of clean, but at the same time, adding color and textures. It's, I don't know how to explain that. It's really tricky. I've used them. Absolutely. Do I use them every day? I don't know. Cause I think depending on your music, if I'm doing a trailer mix, I won't use anything because trailer, which is like action film trailer sounds needs to be as super sharp and punchy as you can get. So I don't even use analog for any of that. And I try not to use a lot of compression use a lot of surgical EQ and a lot of clean reverb and it allows you to get super super clean sharp super fat low end stuff like that so depending on the the song or the project I will change it out marvelous yeah there's a lot of really good um questions um this one here um it's been asked a couple of times um about recording like metal vocals um handheld in a room with speakers i i have done that um really the it's difficult because you know and you can obviously flip the phase and all that kind of stuff but you know you know um Guga garth and that's what he calls himself you know garth richardson um did the first um Rage Against the Machine record like that because Zach De La Rocha wasn't used to wearing headphones. And, and frankly, I think maybe he wasn't complaining, but Garth felt like he wasn't getting the performance he wanted. So he just freed him up and gave him a 57 or a 58 and blasted the speakers in the room because remember they did it at a rehearsal room in Cole Stages, which unfortunately is gone, um, which was an old mortuary for anybody that wanted to know. That was a mortuary. Yeah, used to rehearse there. I had these huge doors. They're like this thick, like the perfect soundproofing, and all the rooms were so soundproofed. But they were always really cold, like no matter. And then I asked the owner, Anthony, and I was like, um, what's up with that? And he's like, oh, yeah, it's just to be a mortuary. That's the reason why all these rooms have these massive thick doors and everything. But anyway, right. so how cool is that to add to the uh, Rage Against the Machine story that the album yeah. was recorded in a mortuary? An ex mortuary. I mean, Jim Morrison did this. Bruce Botnick put up a U forty seven as the real mic, but gave him a, a dynamic. Same as I believe Jack with Steve Tyler. Yeah, you know, put yeah. a big shotgun at his head, but he held a because they want to perform, so they want to yeah. hold a, a dynamic. Yeah, I think it's one of those things that um, to answer your question, you're talking about Pantera's vocals. Um, you know, my experience as, and I've done it many times, is like it works. Um, it's never perfect because you can flip phase. You can put the mic back on the stand, approximate where the singer was, then play the music back in the room, record it, 
and then reverse the polarity. Flip it on its head, and then you can cancel out quite a lot of the bleed. It's pretty remarkable what you can do. But you'll never do it perfectly because the volume is going to vary. The There's going to be all kinds of different issues. It works easily with things like choirs. I've done kids' choirs quite a few times where I put a pair of mics up over the choir and then the kids leave the room and I play the music back in the room at the same volume. And that works 90%. I know that they did that with orchestras at Abbey Road, with orchestral stuff. They'd have the music blasting in the room with the orchestra playing along. And most of the mics, of course, are only facing the, the instruments. So you'd be surprised how minimal amount of bleed there is in there. But then the orchestra would leave and they'd play it back in the room, record again, flip the polarity, cancels out. A good 75% of the bleed, it's pretty miraculous. But when you have a yeah. singer that's performing like this, as you can hear from me moving around, it's not even. So, But I think what Mark was trying to point out, talking about Jack and Jim Morrison and all that stuff, is that the really the performance is the most important thing. If you get a fairly well-recorded, amazing performance, that's much better than a really, really amazingly well-recorded, crappy performance. 100%. I'll take the... Average recording with the amazing performance any day. Yeah, Peter Gabriel recorded so entirely by himself with an SM58 in a chicken coop. <laughs> the speaker is going. I mean, Bono does the same. I mean, it's, I found that for me as a singer songwriter, if I'm playing in a rehearsal with a band and we recorded it, my vocals are better than if I'm sitting by myself doing vocals because I'm not a big guy that likes to do line by line or anything i like the whole performance aspect so i think that's what started with the whole re20 and the sm7 craze and stuff like that ken recorded stevie nicks's vocal dreams was recorded on an re20 in oh, really? fact if you solo her vocal you hear mick in the corner on the vocal so if you mute the vocal on dreams the snare loses all its like value <laughs> so be, here's a little trick so if you listen to dreams go listen to dreams the second verse listen to the snare compared to the first verse the second verse is the only part that they punched in vocals on and so you'll hear the snare kind of just drop out in the second verse that's because that's a punch in after they did it and in fact when they did tusk i think they tried to put an m49 in front of stevie and it just wasn't working which is going back to why ken pushed me to do the re20 because it does work. I don't know if it makes them more comfortable as a singer or if it's just there's something about a dynamic and the proximity effect versus certain mics. It just works really good. So I scratch vocals, always prepare, always record like you're taking a real take. Obviously, that's a huge, huge, huge big advice that I got told when I was just starting as a second. Uh, it's super important because you never know what's keeper. And most of the time, like Phil Ramone talks about recording the band back in the day on their first album and like the dynamic microphones were falling over in the middle of takes. And you can hear it on the record. The guitar goes, and then it comes back and it's on the record and you remember it, but it's all about the performance and the, the takes. Cause I think if I get remembered, I'm going on a tangent here, but I believe when the band recorded, I think Robbie Robertson said that they set them up and A and R fully in gobos and everyone's tied up with headphones and Leon Helms is can't even move his arms and with all tons of tube microphones. And then all of a sudden they said, rip it all out. We want to be a band. And so they put RE twenties, RE, whatever the other REs that were smaller, EV mics, dynamics on everything told that the, all the amps out and everything's bleeding on each other. And it was just a way better project. Now that sounds counterintuitive to my tube comments, but if you're recording a band in a room, you'd be surprised how much you can get away with, with just 57s. Absolutely. No, amazing. Uh, I just, uh, the, the, there's a mic I'm looking for to talk about, but I don't want to talk about it until I end up buying it. 
<laughs> yeah. Because every time I talk about a microphone that's like w weird and random and that we know somebody used it, I go to buy one after I put the video out and they're all like $700. I'm like, wait there, yeah. that used to be a cheap microphone. Yeah. <laughs> the key, Warren, is to buy up all of them <laughs> and then say it and then put them up online. I don't have that much money. Only Danny, uh, only John McBride, sorry. Uh, John McBride does that. Um, I think he, I think John, if he ever retires and wants to sell Blackbird, is going to be a very, very wealthy man. His collection is second to none. Absolutely yeah. insane. I, I went just there. Talked to John last week. He's great. He's doing. They're doing great too down there. No, they're doing. They're doing fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I um I went there about uh, maybe first time. Well, second time I went there was maybe twelve or fifteen, whatever. Really early on when they were sort of really doing great rates on the room, and I went there with the fray and we recorded a Christmas EP at seven a.m. or something crazy like that because they pulled in the night before they had to leave by one or two, so we booked the studio from seven a.m. till one. And for anybody that's a fan and you want to find the Christmas EP, Isaac singing like this, he does that anyway. But give the fact that it was probably seven thirty when I had a mic up. But I remember we were tracking something before that. This is the quick part of the story. And they didn't have any superphonics, any Ludwig superphonics, which, of course, is crazy because, you know, uh, of, of, of that being like a classic um, snare drum. So I said to the assistant, I said, how come you don't have any superphonics? Because we we're doing an EP there, and uh, like another EP there. And he goes, don't worry. Next time you come back, John will have 12. <laughs> and we were back six months later, and then they had, like, the best collection of Superphonics ever. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely amazing. There's a good question here. Um, I, I, I don't want to speak too much about this, but uh, it's a good question to talk about compression because um, Matthew Messner says, What's, what exactly is Waves Arvox doing besides compression? Same goes with MV2. And the reason why I like that is because there's something about the Arvox, which I absolutely love. Um, and what, it, what I've always, the reason why I always reach for it is, yes, it's a really great compressor, um, but it seems to really bring up the low end and the low mids dramatically. So it's a good compressor to reach for when I've got a girl singer or a guy with a thinner voice and I'm trying to bring a bit body in it. And I think it raises this whole question on, sort of what we've been skirting around in so many ways, that, that not all compressors are created equally. The compressors that come with your DAWs are probably absolutely phenomenal at compressing the signal. But the reason why we like these emulations or we like hardware is because they do so much more than just compress. They add tons of, you know, different things that we love. Um, well, the other thing is at the time when, like, the Renaissance series Waves plugins came out, I hate to say it, but the plugins that came with the DAWs weren't very good. Right. So we all flocked to these things in the beginning yep. and got very used to using them. So it's not that we think that they're not good enough. It's just we became used to using certain things in the beginning. I don't even know what's under the hood of an R box. I have no idea. I don't know I don't why know it adds that L1 loads, combined with an emu emulation of a 1176. I uh, use it a little bit to tickle, but I also love the gate. It's ridiculous. It's yep, super yep. active yep. and accurate. And it goes on every vocal just to have that little bit of a clean chain at the very end of it. Yep, I agree. Um, yeah, I agree. I, I, I really I enjoy it a lot. Um, I think the R bass is another one of those ones I'm really a big fa fan of. You know what I mean? absolutely our base on every mix there is a video coming out eventually of me just doing a, a low end thing that you guys want me to do one of those yeah i do <laughs> i'm making a joke because warren and i said how many videos can we do of low end yeah low end videos <laughs> yeah I, I i agree um I mean, I'm in, I'm enjoying everybody on YouTube remaking my videos. I, I, I it's thank you. So is Mark. It's it's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, I I agree with you on the Renaissance stuff. It's it, they're my stock plugins. I reach for them all the time. I know how they work and they just sound great and I I use them. But you're right. When they came out, most of the stock plugins we had were not as good. Now, of course, stock plugins are fantastic. All right, let's keep going through the questions. Um, um, um. um. 
<laughs> somebody's saying from some of the questions in the chat. Uh, he go, um, Yen says it must be happy hour in some parts of the world right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm noticing that. Right on, <laughs> fellas. <laughs> uh, oh, someone asked about Atticus. Oh, I missed that. Atticus. Where's Atticus? Atticus. Where is Atticus? Oh. You can barely see him. He's, I can see him. His, his legs are sticking out. If you can't see him, he's... He's trying to stay as close as he can. The question, I believe, was how does he stay so quiet? I don't know. He, I, I've lucked out. I had a Weimariner named Oliver before him that passed away a couple of years ago. That was the most crazy maniac I've ever had that used to sing along to every song. And he just, he's great. He just, he just becomes, Atticus just sleeps all the time. And he's my little story buddy. So we, we have long conversations about music and compressors and everything. That's wow, amazing. There's just loads of stuff coming in. Yep. Uh... What is a Mixbus 32C? <laughs> what is a Mixbus 32C? Oh, um, yeah, it's a DAW, which is great. Is, a lot of people like it. Is that like the it. Harrison thing? It's the Harrison thing, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. I yeah. saw something about it. I haven't used it. Somebody said, I like this, uh, yours, hi yours, said the difference between a good and a bad vocalist is a good vocalist sounds great on a $50 mic and a bad singer sounds even worse on a $20,000 mic. <laughs> I've, never, I've never heard that before. It's true. Can't fix something that is already clunking. Yep, definitely. Uh... Tips for cellos, Harrison. Oh, I missed um, that. You know, it's orchestra instruments are tricky because it's usually based around two elements, three elements before it even hits the microphone, the player, the instrument, and then the room. Now, if you can't get those three right, you're going to be in really tricky place. For me, I use that word a lot, but for me, I like a U47, a Fat 47, Something that has a good mid-range on a cello. I don't like to stay too far away. I like to get a lot of the low end so I can get a little bit of the Eleanor Rigby kind of sound where you're getting some of the bite out of it. Even for large-scale film stuff, I've been kind of pushed by other engineers that, oh, you can't do that. And it's like, yes, you can. Absolutely. You can totally like an instrument close. Um, but I would say anything that has a large diaphragm, something a little less expensive Audio Technica 4050s, very good mic, $400 mic, sounds great on cello. It's a darker, not super, super, super bright mic. It's not based around an 87 or something like that. Um, but if you want something like an 87, try an 87 or something that has that sound. They just don't sound really great, on my opinion, on a cello. They're a little too bright and zingy sounding. So John's asking monitor preference. Now, obviously, we we know you use ATCs, which are you know they're right up there. PMCs, ATCs, Genelex. I mean, the, the, all of those companies make incredible monitors. Focal in the top of the end range of those companies is unbelievable. But forgetting the monitor manufacturer for a second, um, John Power is asking: Do you prefer three way worth three way monitors versus two way and a sub? Which do you, what do you what do you think? Do you, would you like the combinations? Do you have a do you have a preference? Real quick, Andre, yes, four fourteen on cello works absolutely. That was the cello mic that I learned from Dennis Tusana and Gus at Chicago Recording Company back in the day. So one hundred percent, one hundred percent, four fourteen. Uh, preference on speakers, three ways, two ways, subwoofers, all the good stuff. <laughs> I. I like power. I'm a huge fan of not hearing the speaker compress and distort. I like sub information. I'm still always fighting if I'm getting enough low end because I always tend to lean into it. And I like mid range. I don't like fatigue brightness. I've had a problem over the last 20 years that I mix way too loud to the point now where I'm really trying to force myself to come back and tone down. It's just really hard for me to mix and hear low end at a quiet volume. The Trinov saved my life for many years in a room that I had to have 
accurate listening environment that I didn't like the subs until I got the Trinov and that made me really like it. And just to pause was, you for a second, we're going to do a video with Trinov here and try it out in the room. So back to you. Great. Yeah, it's going to be a neat little Shazam experiment. I would say, you know, there's plenty of speakers out there that are really good. <laughs> the The original Event 2020s, not bad if you keep them quiet. Not bad at all. The Precision 8s by Event, not bad if you keep them quiet. A lot of these speakers, the manufacturers can't put large amplifiers in there or the components aren't made to be able to handle a lot of sound, a lot of pressure. If you're going to go back before then, back to the traditional sense, like a JBL or a larger Yuri, those things can handle a lot more pressure and they feel like you're getting a lot more, but all you're doing is just not being able to clip them. And they still sound funny to me, certain ones like those old, what are they, the 803s, the Yuri's with the blue? I think so, concentric. yeah. Yep. Those were funny, but I'm a fan of the dual concentric in the Tanyoys, like the Gold 10s, the Mastering Lab uh, crossovers in those, you know, Ed Cherney, Al Schmidt, Bill Schnee, George Massenberg, all these guys love this Tanyoy box, Tanoy, whatever way you want to talk about, because of the way um, it, it, represented your mix you can almost hear the speaker in the mixes ethan johns i believe used them and you can talk about the hear, little golds yeah the little they're like little yep. tenue tens yep. with the mastering lab crossover yep. and yeah dave jordan had i don't know if he still has them anymore but i think he had four pairs identical yeah. pairs all with the mastering lab crossovers on them yeah bill had six or seven pairs i'm sure al has them too it's just does one thing really well and you know, they're old speakers. And I bet if these guys didn't have them, it wouldn't matter. Isn't Ivana doing the I think she was doing the, the crossover. crossover for a yeah. while. I don't know if they're still doing it or not. Well, I think you have to I think you customer special order. Yeah. Well you the customer has to find the has to find a pair of the speakers because she doesn't have them. So what you do is you ship them um, you know, a pair that you buy used and then she does the mods for you. Got it. Yeah, I don't believe that the drivers are being made anymore. No. Even they said they are. No, um, I talked to why. somebody at Tannoy a few days ago and unfortunately the Scottish uh, Scottish uh, factory is gone. There's your answer. But they are making them, um, they're still making them in Europe. They're making them in Poland. So you can, but I don't know if those particular drivers um hey brett real quick question brett wheeler i had to get a really super computer <laughs> I just how do you handle the cpu of all the plugins i use it was a decision i made i had a 12 core tower and it was starting to finally take a dive and i had to make a real decision if i was going to end up investing into a new super Mac Pro 2020 Mac Pro versus getting an R2D2. So I ended up jumping for the big guy. And it's, but you know, with the new M1 processors coming out, you're going to probably be able to hang just as well, which makes me go, should have waited. We'll so see. There's a couple of questions here. I, I like, um, there's like three in a row here. I like this one from uh, Yantho, uh, Yantho Weeping Horn. Um, and Yantho says, Warren and Mark, and the reason why I like this question is because this is the one I remember asking Ed, Ed Cherney. Uh, Warren and Mark, obviously Mark, if the building caught fire, what is the one piece of gear you would save? Probably my computer. Oh. Only because of the time it's taken for me to get everything. I have it all backed up, but... I'm looking around going, I can't grab any of my outboard gear, regardless of how much it's worth. I certainly couldn't grab both of my ATC speakers. I couldn't grab my Shadow Hills compressor. I couldn't grab my Tegler stuff down here. I would be able to grab that guitar because I'm running out the door. So I would probably just rip out as much as I could and grab my computer just because it has everything and it would allow me to go right away and work continuously. Cause if I didn't have that, I couldn't work right away. It's a weird thing to say, but 
No, it's a good answer. It's an honest answer. All this stuff's easily replaceable with my insurance. That isn't right away. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Creative stuff is not replaceable. Yeah. Um, Frank Atticus is right here. I can see him. He's having a nap. He's very happy and relaxed. Yeah. Um, other great questions. Um, do, 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 do. Um, oh, we had the upright bass question. Uh, would, uh, well, would that be the same as the cello? The 47 for you still? Definitely me. For the upright, for an upright bass. Yeah, definitely. It's weird. I think Bill brought up the story with you, Schnee, mm -hmm. about the one time he was recording. I was there when he was recording a young kid that was getting into Juilliard and he put a U47 up and the kid's like, oh no, I use this mic. And Bill <laughs> looks at him like, I know what I'm doing. Um, U47 always works on an upright bass, even if the bass is a piece of firewood. Just it, there's something about it that sounds great. M149 actually sounds pretty good too, but that's because of the high output of that sucker. Anything that has a ton of low end, you're able to capture that doesn't have a lot of gain issues. So depending on your ribbon mic, you're not going to end up getting a lot of, you might get a lot of noise with a ribbon mic. Basically what I'm saying is if you're going to try to bring it up too much. Uh, do you have an answer for this? This has been a discussion inside of the Academy. Do you, do you have any particular insurance uh, for your studio equipment or do you just do it under your house? Our house insurance is covered through that, but I actually have an extension through State Farm and they're really great at organization and knowing what you have and what you need to figure out and how to put that together. Uh, it's important because no one really thinks it's going to happen. And it does happen. It could be anything from theft to fire to water damage to anything, anything at all. If the gear just blew up, you, there is clauses you can have under your insurance program that allows you to have that being repaired or fixed. So you just have to keep your eyes open. Know that over the course of a year, it's not going to cost an absolute ton of money considering how much money you might have invested into it. DJ Medusa is buying you a sandwich and says, are there any shortcuts to a better mix that you wish you had known? Before now? Yeah. When you were starting off, what's the, what, what are the shortcuts that you like? Ah, oh, if only. I think buses, stereo buses were, were a big awakening moment for me because I grew up on a console and I was, you know, trained to not, group things in a way when I was starting and I was using a console on my studio, I had other engineers come in and they would always have buses set up for their instruments. And I never, Oh, that's not good. That's not right. Cause you're so used to using single channels and the way you'd sum out and you'd use EQs and then you'd group things for parallel or something. The second I started creating buses for my groups, not only allowed me in my template to create stems in real time, it just made things easier where I only had to program and process things as a whole, literally for a drum set. I don't do a ton of EQ anymore on a full drum set. I just add a Poltec and depending on the compressor or distortion box, it can get me really close, way faster than having five or six plugins. So I'd say stereo bus grouping on top of it. If you have a track, or a session that has 400 tracks, it takes forever to get around it. So being able to group things in elements, color coding correctly, each group consistently where your mind knows exactly what the, the group is based on the color, and then using your stereo buses before it dumps down into the master has saved a lot of time and made things a lot more fun. Here is... Here's an interesting question, uh, question that everybody asks. I don't know if you've answered this under one of the other videos, but uh, Marcio uh, Mosquito is saying, Mark, do you actually use those in-ears for mixing? Absolutely. These suckers, Sig Simgot. Let me see if I can hold it to the... Let me try this again. I don't know. There, there we go. go. Yeah, perfect. So this was a fluke. 
I, I didn't want, when I was doing these videos, I didn't want to um, use big bulky headphones. I just thought they looked ridiculous and I can't get these to work. I just, I, I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> I didn't want big giant headphones when I was mixing because I didn't want two things. I didn't want to be able to be tied down to it. And I, you know, I'm all about challenging myself as well. I think the kicker is if you learn something that you're not supposed to be able to pull off and you're able to pull it off, it becomes way cooler. So I would say, I bought these as a fluke because I'm like, oh, they're $150. We'll see how they sound. And we would go and decide that based around if they're going to work. I did one song with them and they seemed to work well. And then right after the one song I mixed, I mixed that uh, that first mixing pop slash Americana project for you guys for that first mixing video. And that was 100% all the way on these guys and they sound great. I do have these Odyssey LCD X's. They're great. They look cool. They sound great. They have amazing low end. I have the Odyssey in-ears. They sound great. They work really great. Um, the the Receive or uh, there's a couple other companies that I have. I have the Sony's over there. I think I'm starting to realize I can mix on whatever I put myself into if I understand what's doing, but it's never going to work until you really have kind of trust in something. So with these, I knew just by listening to music, I could tell you that they're really bright and that I had to be very careful. But part of mixing is not doing things based around uh, routine and trusting yourself. So if I'm adding 15 decibels of snare, a top end on a snare, something's wrong because I don't ever really have to do that. So if you put on a new pair of headphones and you're doing stuff totally out of your range or a pair of new speakers out of your range, most likely something's wrong. And that goes to everything. So real reality wise my my sounds usually stay the same pretty sets do seem to work okay to get you started on toms and kick my my eq curves relatively same stay the same regardless of who's recording at warren could you say the same about getting tracks they're relative it's not everything is not the same but relative you stay pretty close to the same i think that's why people with 80 series neves are able to do such great work because they're sure. only using it as a sculpting mechanism. Mm -hmm. And it's relatively doing the same thing no matter what for whoever's using it, whoever records it. Yeah, I, I, I when I worked with, I did three albums with Dave Sardi um, a long time ago, like early 2000s. And, you know, Dave's fantastic and has made some of the best sounding records like Jet, obviously, and uh, the first Wolf Mother record, which is phenomenal. Yeah. And I had an 8058 and an API, um, and he helped reinforce a lots of what we're talking about. Like, he would mix. I remember we were sent the Towers of London record. Anybody remember the Towers of London? They were like this kind of like uh, British, I can't remember if they were Welsh, but anyway, they were British, um, like metal kind of 70s, new wave of new wave of British metal, kind of bit trashy, you know, band. And we got sent this record, and I can't remember who had recorded it. But anyway, it had like five mics on every single guitar. And so he said to me, can you just output this through the console and choose choose some mics for me? Like, he was testing me, you know, choose some mics. So I was like, oh, all terrified, you know, because we were making a record. So he went off into the other room at The Pass, Dave Way's old studio, and went back to doing some tracking while I output this for him so he could come back in the next day and mix it. And I remember just like the five mics all together just sounded like total mush because they were all completely out of phase of each other. And, you know, that thing that we all do, you know, record, let's put up more mics, it's going to sound better, you know. And um, so I ended up like choosing the one that was labeled 57, like you do. It was the close mic 57. It was the only one that I thought, 
anybody had a chance of being able to make a choice with. And what he did is like when he came into mix, like he came in, he started mixing. He's like, okay, cool. You can go back and work on something else. I went on. And then I came back at the end of the mix and he said, do me a favor. Can you do some prints? So I would do the prints. like vocals up, vocals down, guitars up, guitars down, snare up, snare down, all these different prints. He gave me a list of about 20 different prints to do in case the label wanted some quick changes or the band. So I did all the prints. And so I'm sitting there listening to every single print as it goes down in real time. And I go over to the console and the thing about this, just the same thing with APIs, classic APIs and classic Neves, is all the boosts and the cuts are what you expect. And because you're quote unquote limited, for want of a better word, with the frequencies that you can do on an AC series console, you know, compared with the fully sweepable, you know, SSL, you know, semi parametric, you know, or other consoles with fully parametric, because you're limited, it sort of it sort of became like a jigsaw puzzle of logic. You go to the kick, you go 60 boost. You go to the snare, you go, ah, oh, put a bit of 220 on that. You go to the bass guitar, you put a bit of 110 on it. It's amazing, and it all just starts to fit together like this incredible jigsaw puzzle. And then before you know it, you got a record. <laughs> it's it, it's the, all the limitations were actually so helpful. And like you just said, I was, this is all just adding on to what you said a couple of minutes ago. People that have an 80 series console, they have a methodology of working. It doesn't mean that you don't use plugins and tweak things and maybe use, um, like we used to use a Massenberg on the master bus, you know, EQ, and maybe we would print it through an SSL bus compressor, sometimes the Focusrite Red. We'd try different things. But essentially 90% of it was on what the console did. It was the sound of the console. Absolutely. Um, reading some of these. I know, some great questions. Um, Dennis says, there's two questions that are similar. Can you talk about your mix bus philosophy? A couple of people asked earlier about what you do or don't do on your mix bus when you're mixing in the box. Yeah. In or out, I, I try to chase one thing, which is you know, retaining the biggest element you can out of your master. Bigger than life. I have a hard time when I click in and listen to a reference that I'm given after I'm starting my mix and I'm clicking into my mix and it sounds smaller. It really hurts. It's just like, what? Can't be. And I know some people would rather go for character and they don't focus on that because honestly, speakers are going to make something sound bigger. But for me, I try to choose bigness and bigger than life over anything. And with a two bus, that means everything. So it, I choose a in-the-box compressor or an EQ or a tape emulation around that. If it shifts things in a way, that's okay. But if it makes it smaller or it takes low mids out of something, I don't like that. I get really worried because I feel that that is creating a counterintuitive approach of how I'm trying to get things to sound in general. Not to go against any companies or anything, but when I do put something in line and it takes something away, it, it puts me into a real hard place to decide if I want to continue on with that. That could be a bass guitar, that could be the, the drum mix, that could be the full mix. If I put a tape saturation plug it in and it takes low end out, like let's say 30 Hertz, just a little bit. I don't want to have to add that back with an EQ. Now, some things you have to like analog, you, you kind of have to know that, but it's just a little different character to deal with that. Um, I'm sorry. I'm reading some of these other questions. There's just, they're just folding down, like falling down the stairs. I would just use something in a very tasteful way. I like two or three different types of multi-band compression on a two bus. Sometimes it's literally the fat filter multi-band compressor where you can really figure out what you want to take out of it. Sometimes it's the Acoustica Titanium, which is, I'm assuming, the TubeTech uh, SMC2B, which I have the hardware of. And I like the glue. Symptonic glue, which is the SSL style. And I like SSL's bus compressor. They're all fantastic. 
I do like the ones with mixed knobs because what I can do is create the glue and then get the like definition of the size back with the mix knob and kind of fool around with that. But I, my approach is I do add uh, API 550 or 5500 EQ on a two bus because it's becoming a new thing with me where I like the curve. I like the 50 Hertz and the 10 K and whatever happens with the 20, 25, 20 op amp, whatever that's doing to a two bus really seems to make it sound like a record. So I do use that almost on everything. I used to do the Poltec thing. I know Warren does that. He likes the Poltex. Um, I think it's just, you go for what you can do. I'm not a huge multi-multi uh, guy, like Brower who uses five different compressors. That's tricky for me. My mind can't like approach that. It gets really mucky, but that doesn't mean it doesn't work for some people. Absolutely probably works, definitely works for Michael. So I think for me, it's more simpler is better. And then I use a limiter for makeup. And I use it, even if I know it's going to mastering like Eric Boulanger at the bakery or something, it will just go to him with the limiter and then one without. So he can hear at least what I'm doing and what I like to hear. Cause I like to shave off the snare and stuff before it goes to them anyways. So I might just bring out the volume just a little bit so they can do their twinkling afterwards. Fantastic. Uh, lots of questions versions of the question of sort of how do you know when the mix is finished what's your sort of process do you have a, a checking process do you listen in the car do you have it on do you take an hour break come back and listen to it do you wait till the next day what, what is your sort of process of signing off on the mix for yourself when i was kind of getting started it was you know you had time to kind of like a mix and then wait until the next project came in or you could really do 40 different versions of it to make sure you're happy. After the experience and after the 10,000 hours it took you to get to a place you feel comfortable, I just got to a place where now I'm working on three or four projects a day. That doesn't mean I'm finishing three or four projects a day. It just means I'm working on three or four separate songs or cue for a film a day my template set up where everything is falling in line all i have to really touch for recall is my tube tech and all that is is just touching the threshold everything else everything else stays the same so for me when i know it's done is when it just sounds right and i literally will mix a song for two hours and go on to the next song of a completely different album and then come back the next day on the same song. And I will catch stuff that I didn't do. But a lot of times I don't like printing in one day. I don't like mixing a song. I, it happens all the time or I have to because of time constraints or whatever. But if I had my choice, I would mix it all the way to the place where I'm like, this sounds good. And then I'd leave it and I'd come back in a day or two while I'm working on something else. And by doing that, I put it up in, it could be ready to print the second I put it up. And I'll go up the vocals a little too loud or up the snares too loud. You can't always be satisfied because that's the never ending devil's triangle that we as engineer mixers get lost in. When to stop, when it's enough, because how many times have you guys mixed something, hated it, absolutely despised it, embarrassed what you did. People think it's great, but you think it's terrible and you're just shamed. And then like four months later, you come back and you hear it again. You're like, this sounds freaking great. What did I do? How come I can't get it to sound like that now? It's because everything is evolving. Your opinion's always changing. Tomorrow, you could use a different compressor that you would have used today. It's just knowing that it's all about the, the experience and the, the moment of decision-making. It's why I've flocked more to uh, producing and mixing versus engineering, producing and mixing full albums. I still do, but the, the project has to be something I really want to be a part of is because I like coming in super fresh and then leaving. It's because it's as a creative, you still are using your mind as a mixer, similar to you would if you were writing a song or something like that. So you have to come in fresh and know what's going on. And just trust that your instinct that day is going to do what it does. 
Marvellous. Uh, there was another earlier question um, that I really liked that there's variations on. Talking about, you know, obviously the classic way of making records. You know, we are talking earlier about rumours and we were talking about greats like Ken and Jack Douglas and Shelly Yakis and Jay Messina, all of these people that are mentors to us, either directly or indirectly. Um, they all talk about Bill Schnee. Um, they all talk about recording the way that they want to hear it, committing the sound. Do you still think that way when you're recording? Um, and then a couple, somebody, a couple people ask that, but then somebody else also asks, like, well, how do you decide? How do you decide what the sound's going to be? It's the same approach of just trusting whatever your body's telling you at that moment. You know, a centered, what, how do you pronounce? S-E-N-O-R-D, D-L-4. Yes, I'm a huge John Lennon fan. And that inspires me every day. Like that guy credibly inspires me every day. I have no idea what kind of person I would have been like without the Beatles. So to say a course of whatever, I mean, it's, I'm going to think about his tape delay when I'm mixing a song, or I will think about the drums that Jim Keltner played on on Mind Games, which is just outstanding sounding, or the same as the production value on Double Fantasy. Like, I still see Jack Douglas as unattainable, mystical God. <laughs> that was part of something so magical that I can't process that. So when I think about Double Fantasy, I think about that. And how special that record was and how unbelievable it sounds. I still listen to it today. The drums on that record are so unbelievable. The toms, just the arrangements that Jack Douglas did with John Lennon. Unbelievable. So all these little things, it's the same thing going back to like Counting Crows and T-Bone Burnett, his influence. It's all about influence of what they're hearing. Now, they may be hearing something like, oh, I wanted to do this because it sounded like the Beatles. I do remember John Lennon saying when they were recording Woman, that was his Beatles song. Let's record this like, let's like make it like the Beatles. Did it sound like the Beatles? Absolutely not. But it sounded like John Lennon and anything that John Lennon does sounds like the Beatles. So there's reference to anything you can make it do. I think trusting yourself when you're starting, I did that guitar video yesterday and somebody said, it reminds me of Daniel Lenoir and what he does with his sonic scapes and Brian Eno and they're just textures. And it's exactly why I do that because that's what it reminds me of too. And I think there's no new ideas. I think the ideas that come new are the ideas you combine from your influences, which create new vision. And as a mixer, I try not to like reinvent the ball or reinvent the game or anything, but I do like to kind of pull certain things and sometimes I will literally pull uh, De Carlo's drum sound that Jack mm -hmm. produced Lee De Carlo who engineered Double Fantasy his his drum sound and then Bill Schnee's bass sound from this thing and then Michael Brower's vocal reverb sound from that Sade record that I love and all these things and turn that into one sound in my head when I'm mixing this R&B track so it just it it just comes when you hear it. It's instinct. Great. I'm cherry picking some great questions here. Here's one I think we should talk about because I get asked it um, maybe 25 times a day. And I have my answer. I'm not going to influence yours. But how much headroom do you leave for the mastering process? Can't tell you how many times I get asked that day. Well, I think that was important five, 10 years ago. I'm not sure if it's as nearly as important now knowing that the architecture in these DAWs can handle overs, 32-bit stuff like that, up processing. I mean, I remember back in your then, layway days, you would end up going and trying to find out how do you make, why isn't an in-the-box mix as good as a console mix? And at the time, I believe that the busing system in Pro Tools specifically, I'll talk about that because that's what I use, was in sense that by the time you bottleneck down to your master, if you were you know, hitting lights and stuff, that it just sounded clamped and not very pleasing. So if you brought everything down with clip gain and you're hitting your two bus quieter, it just was leaving a lot more headroom. It's like if you hit electronics hard, you're gonna start clamping things down. 
Now I think you can get away with the things a little bit easier, but off of approach and what I do, and I'm sure what Warren does similar sometimes is you end up kind of going into a routine. And for me, I like to get a rough mix going. And I always ask the client to make sure they include the ref, but make sure that the prints, the session sounds like the ref relative without the EQ and the reverbs and stuff, but the balance is close. And then when I put it on, I can bring everything down clip gang right away. So the peak is negative four. That's my sweet spot. So when I put in my buses, they're only tapping a little bit right away and I don't have to do a ton of gain staging. There was another question about, do I start every mix with the drums? And it's yes, only because that's, I have a hard time starting with a guitar and a vocal and knowing that there's drums in there. It's only because I like drum and bass and I feel that that's a super important element. And I don't think that it, it causes problems with my vocal, saving it to last. I don't know why, it just doesn't seem to ever affect it. I've tried a couple times to do it the other way around and it's a disaster. So I just stay with my way. For some reason it does work, but it's the same as my favorite mixers all do uh, audience perspective drums and I do drummers perspective. So it sure. doesn't mean I'm following anything crazy. No, I. I think uh, this, this is a good question when you talk about the mixing vocals first or last. I think if, if you're producing a record really well, you're starting off with a vocal and then building the tracks around it. So if that's been done really, really well, like I, quite often I've got close to a keeper vocal and acoustic guitar before I even add instruments. And, quite, and you can list thousands of records made where they use some of the earliest vocals because everybody has performed around them and nothing feels better, especially in a pre kind of gridded world where the musicians were playing off of the lead vocal. So why do I bring that up? I bring that up because then it doesn't really matter which order you mix in because you can mix the drums first because everything works around the vocal. I think it's a difficult world where, you know, the vocals left till the very, very end. And there, there was no scratch vocal in the whole process. And you just built a track up. You might be th moving between the vocal and the tracks, trying to figure out how to make them relate together. But in a more traditional recording environment where you have a great scratch vocal, you're tracking around, you can, you can, and there's obviously going to be different opinions, but you can leave the vocal till last because they've been recorded to fit around it. Um, so I, there's a ton of really good questions here. Um, there, some some of them are sort of yes and no. Oh, by the way, slick with the K S L I K. We did answer that question about recording uh, vocals um, in a room. You maybe slipped off and went to another video and came back. But if you go back earlier, we talked about that. We talked about how Regiment Against the Machine recorded vocals in a room. How Garth did it. All that stuff. Um, Steve K asks, do you avoid listening to any of your own mixes? Should I listen to other music that I enjoy, i.e. classic rock, etc.? Or would that discolor my mixes to sound less like they need to sound like for today? Ooh, I have, what do you think of that? Do you reference classic stuff even though it might not be necessarily current? Yeah, I have to because I love the way it sounds. <laughs> but here's the thing. I mix so different than what I love. It's just something that I, I don't know why, but it's like when I did the reissue for Fleetwood on the Mirage album, that was like Ken did the original with Keith and it's a great sounding record. And when we did the reissue, I added more bottom because that's how I mix. And there was a couple parts, don't tell anybody that we used a sample on the kick because Mr. Featherfoot, Mick Fleetwood, who's my favorite drummer of all time, we couldn't get the punch the correct way. So we added to tuck certain things in and you couldn't hear it. You wouldn't know that it's there because we were augmenting. But my point is I hear differently than I love. My favorite records, I can't even do what they do. And I wouldn't because it's, there's just a weird combination. I do listen to my records and I am absolutely terrified at what I hear. Absolutely. I don't like the way I mix. I always question every mastering engineer. Are you sure there's too much? Are you, is there too much low end? No, it sounds great. It's huge. No, no, no. It's just a little too 
boomy. It's on my, I'm listening on my iPhone and the snare is gone. It, the limiter on my mind, it's something's gone. And like, I'm my worst critic. It's always going to sound the worst as the person. It's the same as the singer saying, can you turn, can you turn my vocal down a little bit? Because they don't want to hear themselves because they're embarrassed internally about for some for insecure or they they're focused hyper focusing on one thing instead of the overall picture listen to your peers listen to people around them try to get the positive feedback even if it's negative use that as a positive try to use anything you can to better yourself and if you don't trust yourself it's really hard to if you don't listen to other people and if they say it's great it's great and go with that a um, couple of questions. Uh, Tom uh, Thanos. Hey, Thanos um, is asking about saturation on main vocal. Yeah, I like the, I call it the fur. You know, it's I don't like super black keysy kind of distorted vocals when it doesn't need to be there. But when it does, it's awesome. You know, the decapitator is phenomenal. The thermonic culture UAD plugin is phenomenal. The uh, just stomp box plugins are freaking great. Sansamp plugin, a miracle on vocals. Uh, Klanghelm has a thing, I think it's called SDR. Somebody will correct me, SDR or something that lets you go between transformer, tape, tube, uh, solid state, and overdrive. And that will allow you to do all these sort of unique distortions. When you're a mixer and everyone's kind of staying in the box, you want to create your own sounds. So if you can find your own distortion box, if you have the option to do a loop back, that's why I was talking about tape machines earlier, cheaper tape machines is because you can do stuff that no one else can do with distortion. And then your mixer goes, or your client goes, how did you do that? Because <laughs> they don't have access to that certain thing. So find stuff, even if you're at like a garage sale and there's like old receivers you know, I think they used to make those high fidelity reverb spring delays for high fi systems and stuff like that. It's just cheap, old, realistic, you know, brand reverb, stuff like that. Try to incorporate all these unique custom things into your sounds. And then you're independent from other people. And that's a kicker. Same as reverb, same as reamping and stuff like that. No, that's absolutely fantastic. Um... There's an interesting question here. So Emery or Emra um, Tama or Tama says, Mark, how much are you being involved in a project? For example, do you come up with the ideas of, let's say, do you suggest you wouldn't use that guitar part or change an instrument completely? I mean, obviously, the quick answer to that would be, you know, are you if you're the producer, then obviously that's a big part of your job. But I think maybe another way of looking at that question is like, just say somebody sends you something to mix. And you like it, and you, you're kind of invested in it. You think it's a great song, you like the artist, think they have a great voice, you think the arrangement's good, but there's things that you just wish they had redone. How, you know, not necessarily, I think this is the kicker, because obviously if something's terrible, we all go, that's terrible, redo it. But if you felt like something could have something added to it that would really take it over the edge, do you find yourself doing that, or do you think you're always balancing kind of time and money? You know, going, well, if I get them to retract that, I won't hear it from them for three weeks. How, what do you, what's your, what's your sort of process? You have to kind of, yeah, you have to balance, Warren, you know this, you have to balance your relationship like almost like you're a therapist with the artist. So what you're doing is you're sensing their temperament. So if you feel that it needs to be redone, you have to decide when it's right to tell them. The other thing is that half the time, if the music's great and it sounds great, and you know that their temperament's going to be a certain way. You just move on, you mix it, and you're excited, and then you move on. It is what it is. You have to always remember when it is what it is, you, you, you move on. That's the performance. That's the representation they're trying to achieve, moving on. And then sometimes weird stuff happens where you get, you know, called, and they're like, we want you to mix this song or this record. And you listen, and you're like, this is really good. And then they get excited. And then you start like befriending each other. And I, I'm dealing with that right now with this artist named Zeev, who's a phenomenal writer. And he's been producing his own stuff for a long time. And 
um, I just really jived with him really well. And I gave him some ideas and he was super open to it. And now like we're talking about, you know, my assistant is like going to reamp some stuff on his synth with like literal real analog synth bass versus it software bass stuff like that. And it's like, you just kind of inspire yourselves when you're working with clients. I just want to create the best thing I can create. The song isn't great and I'm being asked to work on it. I do reach out and try to help as many people as I can. Even if the song, in my opinion, isn't amazing, I just want to help. So we try to do things that are unique enough that it's going to create a nice atmosphere and a nice uh, relationship working wise to better the track. Even if the song's already really good, you can always take it up a little bit more. Nuno's asked this question a few times, so I apologize, Nuno. I keep seeing it and wanted to ask it. Um, and you've just refined the question even more, which is fantastic. Nuno asks, approaching approach to mix drums that are tracked in a small space without any room mics. And then Nuno adds, I like to send drum tracks to the IK Sunset Sound Reverb, that's the, the room emulation, and also likes the ST Devil Lock. Do you have any tips for when somebody sends you something which is literally kick, snare, pair of overheads? Yeah, I like the dead drum sound. I grew up loving rumors. I was about to say rumors, sounds. yeah. I mean, that's as dead as you can get. I mean, Warren's done drums in that room. It's yep. carpet, literally. Fuzzy little fuzzy stuff creating the most dead sound you can imagine. Now, the key with that is you want to train the drummer to not hit as hard. Like Ben from the fray is a mofo when it comes to hitting a drum set. It's an incredible drummer. But like I always used to, when I remember first hearing the fray before they were even signed i used to go that guy that reminds me of fleetwood mac yeah just his performance his vibe everything about it so it does matter what Plus kind he, of drummer he has you the are. brain he has the brain of a producer he wants to produce so he thinks yeah. about his drums in the context of the song as opposed to here's this great fill i just made up exactly yeah. exactly just for the song so but mm -hmm. i would say a drummer like ben or a drummer like mick fleetwood in a dead room will always succeed because of that or Ringo. That's why if you listen to Plastic Ono Band, which we're hitting 50 years now, going back to John Lennon, Ringo's drum sound on that album is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And that's like, a lot of it is just because he's decided not to play cymbals or he's playing light. So I learned right away in the beginning that the best way to get a unbelievable drum sound is to have the drummer play very light and then amplify it with great preamps and compression and stuff to make it sound bigger than life. Now, if you get the tracks and they aren't played like that and the cymbals are too much, just take them down. I mean, there's so much opportunity now where you can reamp or you can re uh, sample or do anything you need to fake it. And as a mixer, you need to do it in a way that no one knows you're doing it. You don't want to hear the gun doo -doo 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 on the snare. So you have to like automate triggers. So if it's light and there's ghost nuts, you got to keep the original all sorts of little tricks. So James is asking, because um, all the Academy members, by the way, hi, everybody from the Academy here. Lots of you here. Amazing. Obviously know that I use um, Poltex. Whether I'm mixing hybrid or not, I try, you know, whether I'm mixing through the full console or I'm just using it for more of a monitoring situation, I do. There's a couple of things that are pretty irreplaceable for me. Not to say there isn't plugins for them, but it's usually... The bus compressor, obviously, if I can, I hit that. Obviously, I have the Tegela or the Tegela um, Creme bus compressor as well. And I have Poltex, particularly on the bass. It's absolutely amazing. Um, they're asking, what is it for you? Is there like certain pieces of hardware? Oh, you look <laughs> certain it, pieces of hardware. About you... Atticus. Oh. oh, yeah. Yeah. Hardware is. So I can be confident to say that in the box, I, I could do what I do. I'm very happy. Now, if I have a choice, hardware, I do like it. It does matter to me. It does help me get to a place faster. Big fan of the API 5500 EQ. It creates a very instant sound that really works well. The plugin does something similar, but doesn't do it. Same as the TubeTech multiband, it does something different. Same as the Tegler audio compressor that I have down here. That's the uh, Schwischcraft that is its own device. I don't even know what it does. I'm trying to talk to Michael and say, what is it doing? 
And I'm believing it's the line amps or the tubes that are making it sound magical. Same as the Tigra reverb, same as the Bricasti reverb. Like all these things really do work great. And there are plug-in counterparts. Like my template is set where I have my Bricasti running into the full mix, but I have the seventh heaven running 100% into all the stems in the same setting. And it's totally doing the same thing. Now there's a little bit of a difference in a sound character that I like on a hardware, but relative plug-in stuff is just as go-to or I almost feel like, oh no, I'm not as, I got, I can't as it is hardware. Converters, summing mixers, you know, if I had great speakers and a great DAC, two channel with a good monitor controller and a good sounding room, I could do anything. I would feel just as strong to do it, but I like to be comfortable. It's like people wanting to work in their own world. It's like why people chose Reebok instead of Nike. It's why people drive Chevy trucks instead of Toyotas. They like what they like. They stay what they like. They might like a Gibson better than they like a Schecter, whatever it is. I think the biggest kicker is choose what you love, build what you love, know that there's access around it, learn how to get around it, and then do what you do. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. A lot of people are asking, you know, about getting rid of harshness and stuff. And I've been trying to answer that in some of the questions. I'm a big fan, obviously, of Oak Sound. But, you know, uh, DSs. And then uh, somebody asked Oak here. Oak Sound, the Soothe, the yeah, soothe, soothe tune. tune. Yeah, yeah Soothe Tune, which is an absolutely amazing plugin. Um, it's dangerous. Got to be careful with that. Oh, folks. yeah. Yeah, because you're going to want to put it on everything. <laughs> it's almost you know like it. the Clarifonic, where it's like, if you don't step away from it, you're, you're going too far. Yep. Always do the 15%, 10% rule. Yeah, oh, this sounds good. Come back 10%. Yeah, no, I, I agree. We, we had this conversation inside the Academy and, and underneath a lot of the video, and I was answering people. I was talking about uh, Karen, I think is here. Hey, Karen um, was asking, Karen Bassett was asking about that inside the Academy. And I... You know, the thing about it is, is like, I agree with you because it's Jim Scott who told me that I was working, did an album with Jim and we were mixing and he, he's just said to me, the loudest thing in the mix is the last thing you mixed, you know, wake up in the morning, come back and the vocals two dB too loud, because guess what? You were mixing the vocal, wake up in the morning, come in, the guitar's too loud. Cause guess what? You were mixing the guitar. So he, you just sort of learn to get it and go, yeah, that sounds great. I love how bright it is. And then you just back it off. We just did that yesterday. I was mixing a track here. Um, and I brightened on you. You and I were talking about it yesterday, Mark. I used the SSL oh, the to, to brighten it because there's something magical about SSL EQs, but, I also put in my Phoenix EQs because those Phoenix EQs are super sweet on the high end. And then I put a little tiny bit in on the plugin. <laughs> so I had plug in a DB, two, three DB on the SSL because you can be quite aggressive with it. And then two or three DB on the Phoenix. And I'm like, yeah, this is, sounds great. Put on the headphones. It's like, whoa, what happened? You know, yeah. I just got carried away. I ended up putting 7 dB of subtle changes. But unfortunately, that many subtle changes meant it was pretty unbearable. So you, yeah, you learn to sort of go, okay, whatever I'm doing, I'm just going to back it down a little bit. And you end up getting it right almost every time, first time, rather than waiting to hear it and know that you were wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I, I agree. I mean, I could tell you that I came from the land of, oh, don't EQ it or take it easy on the EQ because it's going to add phase and stuff. But and then I remember Ken and I were tracking at the village on Studio One, Studio A, whatever one room you want to call it. The first room when you enter to the left. And it's the one with the 8048 console. And we were recording piano and he's like, it feels dark. And I felt like it felt fine but he literally popped in the 1081s and pegged top bands of both of the EQs. And I'm just like, what are you doing? Like as a joke, cause we're buddies and we goof around in sessions and stuff. And he's like, sounds great. And I instantly was like, no, it doesn't. Why would you do? And then he's, um, it sounds great. Like it totally worked. And usually I would not have done that. I would not have just pegged it. I'm not that kind of guy. I was trained not to be the peg kind of guy. Ken's a lot more rock and roll. And he called, he's like, you're such a snob. And he was right. Like sometimes you just <laughs> got to just 
go extreme, go a little radical. There's nothing wrong with just getting out there because honestly, phase shifting is part of the sound of some of these special records too. I wouldn't do it every time. And I certainly wouldn't do it instinctively every time, but you would be surprised how much you can get away with. Yeah, that's that's a whole whole conversation. I, when we were in um, Blackbird doing a masterclass, when was it? When three years ago? Um, obviously, at least two years ago because of COVID. But um, Reed Reed Shippen came in and gave a talk to all the masterclass uh, people, and it was fantastic. And Reed comes in and great bunch of it's all Academy members, and and one of them asked you know, about EQing and how, you know, basically pointed to videos online, which talk about, you know, when you're using EQ, there's a phase shift. And, and uh, Reed said, basically what you just said, he said, you know, and And they're like, well, you know, it's a phase shift. And he's like, does it sound better? He's like, most of the records we all growing up listening to had massive EQ boosts and cuts and dramatic things. And we all loved the way they sounded. We're sort of, but it's like, well, if you see, if you watch, and then all the words about looking come up, you know, and people start talking about videos they've seen and how people demonstrate it on, you know, in 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 a in a video and all this kind of stuff. And the reality is, is quite a lot of what we we love has has been dramatically done. I mean, we can watch mixers all day that are sitting there, particularly on SSLs, like we were talking about earlier, boosting high mids and high end into compression, and yet. If you put it on a scope, it might have some phase shift. But does it sound good? Heck yes. It sounds awesome. The high mids go pa pa pa. The snare goes pa 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 pa. The guitars go ka. And they do all of those kind of things. But they probably don't look good on an oscilloscope. So I think I think that's always an interesting kind of conversation where people talk talk about these things, um, you know. Um, you know, changing the phase. And if it's affecting it adversely and sounds worse, that's when you worry about it, not what it looks like, you know. Um, oh, yeah, somebody, uh, Mr. Morphe- Morpheus, did ask this, a couple of people asked about this. Um, how important are your converters? And I suppose that leads into, like, what you have, do you love them, you know, what have you tried, how did you, how did you end up with the converters that you've got? Uh... Yes. And then just tagging on to the last thing that Warren was saying about EQ and Shipton, he's a great dude. He's awesome. And he makes a million percent sense. Like just be radical. The thing I do get caught up with is knowing and when you have kind of a luxury to be able to use a couple different mastering testers for a project, you can hear really quickly what people are doing to your mixes so one guy might be doing a lot of EQ and you can hear it. And then there's people that were like Doug Sachs or Eric or, you know, that kind of like that literally are all about like is straight wire and super son you can get. And that's why they kind of get what they get. You just have to be careful to see what works. Cause I can't say either way, yes or no of that. And that goes into the converter talk because with converters, it's the same thing. I actually have a good, video I've been sitting on for almost two months now of a converter shootout of me doing Ooh. a print test. <laughs> and I don't know if people will like it or not. It might get, you know, <laughs> 300 views, but it's, it's pretty, it's pretty cool, but it's subtle, but it's like I say that 5% you can't get, you can't get it. I don't care. It's a hundred percent to anybody else because you can't get it. If you can't get 5%, it's way more than 5%. So it's like when you're starving and you don't have money, you $5 is everything. So 5% is a lot. Converters are getting really good. Yeah, they are, aren't they? Like, Pro- honestly, this little crazy. SSL2 sounds really good. Mm-hmm. The Apollo sounds really good. The Lynx Aurora, who's going on 18 years or something. I have a pair of those. Really good. And I still have... I have, we have pretty much everything. We're blessed. We have, yeah. we have the QES, the Pad Two. I don't know what happened to QES. Does anybody know what happened to that guy? He didn't respond to my emails. I hope he's okay. Sorry. Say again. He passed away. He passed away. Oh, it's terrible. Terrible. Yeah, he stopped responding. I didn't realize he had passed away. Sorry. 
But his pad two was just phenomenal. Then I have Apogee's old ones, even older, late 90s. The Apology. Yep. <laughs> I have the... Back then. I had the, the purple one. It's called... I don't know what it's called, but it's got the soft limiting in it, and we still use it to print drums through. We're crazy people. The Rosetta people. or the pre-Rosetta? Oh, it's pre-Rosetta. It's called... Oh, the Purple Inn. The 96K one, it's yeah. It's the special edition. It's called literally called Special Edition is Purple. It used to belong to Dave Jordan. It's what he made all of his great awesome. records on when, when he went digital. Um, and then um, I have 192s. I have Lavries. I have, I mean, I have all different kinds of things. And I'll be honest, I haven't, you know, and I use the audience stuff. Oh, and the Steinberg stuff is fantastic. I think we're a bit spoiled. And, of course, Antelope. The new Antelope's amazing. UAD, we have the UAD ones. We have the X-18s. Uh, sorry, X-16s. Uh, we have an Apollo. I think, anyway, I'm waffling on, but my point is I agree with you. We're at a place where the quality now is unbelievable. I think converters are important. I don't think it's going to make or break a single being a number one hit. I think the 192 was a little rough compared to the new avid i'm not even it's not even new it's five years old but the newer avid hdio um i have really boutique high-end converters because of uh, my never-ending journey of going after stuff karen you said digidesign a88s nothing sounds like that now the A88 Mix Plus systems were the absolute crappiest, worst thing I've ever heard over ADATs, over DA88s. I made the a triple A. Of, I made at least one album that debuted at number one on A88s. <laughs> I got a couple. Yeah. I mean, it was just the worst, just the worst. I mean, the, so, first, the first top 10 album I ever made was on D24. I mean, just this the predecessor. is. I mean, we could go back to like the dash machine and like how great those sounded. And I think Garth was lead. still using D24 when HD came out. And he was still making top 10 albums. Yeah. It's, it, uh, you know, think about all the records that came out between 2002 and 2009, whenever HD came out and yep. really came around. Because I think Pro Tools 7, which was 2009 was starting to get better. So yeah, 7.4 was a huge thing. But no, I think I think it was like 2004 I bought the HD system. So that's crazy that it's 16 slash 17 years old since, you know, it got absolutely amazing. I mean, HD but on, we, it's been sounding incredible. People are talking about Motu boxes. It's funny. I remixed a thing that was tracked on a Motu 24IO. Remember that? Yep. And that was at least 17 years old. And the drum sounded great just great i couldn't believe it because at the time i'm like about to so i just think it's like depending on where you're at and how you're trying to hear and you always want the i have this crazy journey my converters now are you know pretty crazy and they do help there is a difference i love it and that's all i can say now is it radical to do that do you need it no because if you're in the box and you have a good DAC. You can get a benchmark DAC one for six hundred dollars, and it's an absolute incredible DAC that superstar mastering guys are still using. It's cheap, and it has a great monitor controller on it. The um, Kahuna is asking, please, can I do a low pass on sixteen K on my master? I think what they're asking about is like a lot of modern pop stuff. Um, you know there's not much going on above 16 K and it seems like it's, it's low past. Yeah. I'm assuming. Yeah. I think a lot of it would be, you know, super, super, super high frequency. I don't even know if I can hear above 15 K really, honestly, I don't even think I care that I can hear above 15 K. Now, is there things in that above that you want? Absolutely. There's harmonic stuff, content, like I can definitely hear the difference between 96K versus 44.1. And that has to do with some airiness or whatever it's causing it. But I don't know. I don't know how it works when you're doing a super airlift at 20K. But if you do that on like a piano or an orchestra, you feel it, you hear it. 
So you got to be careful when you're doing the high pass. I don't even like doing a super, super low pass sometimes because sometimes some of that low stuff or the high stuff that you're cutting out is just perceived as something. You just got to decide if it's going to be best for you because once it goes to a MP3, it's going to shelve it down to 12K or whatever it is anyways. I don't know what a 320 MP3 cuts out at. Do you? Anyone? Anyone? Not off the top of my head. I'm sure we could Google it in a second. Um, people are asking about the Burl. Um, I have a very strong opinion about the Burl. I think it's absolutely phenomenal, depending on how you record. When we uh, when we were doing the Aerosmith record years ago, 10 years ago now, uh, nine years ago, whatever it was, um, we got to try out every single one. And we ended up with the Lavery of all of them. The Burl we absolutely loved, but we found that we had used so many tubes so many transformers we'd also gone to tape and then transferred because we were using what was then the clasp system so we were coming off the repro head so we were getting tape we were doing so much analog schmanalog along the way so much of it that we actually found the burl was incredible and adding all these beautiful lows and all this kind of stuff but we actually didn't need it because we had already shaped the sound inside of Pro Tools the way that we wanted to be because we'd already come off tape and we'd already thrown ribbons and tubes and stuff like that. However, when you don't have several million dollars worth of gear like we did, because it was ridiculous, we had everything we wanted. Two tape machines running together at 15 ips, two-inch tape machines, drums going on to a 16-track head stack. I mean, everything was fat with a pH. However... The Burl is going to be wonderful. This is my opinion for anybody who doesn't have a million dollars worth of gear because it does impart a big sonic footprint on it. So I'm a big fan of it. I really am. But for us, we didn't find like we needed it. We actually wanted a facsimile of the mix that we were putting down through the Neve. But not to take anything away from it, it's it, it's great. The, the Burl is amazing, especially if you want an analog sound and you don't have all of that gear. Anyway, that's I just th- my personal opinion. Yeah, I think it's exactly right. I owned a bomber, and I've used the, the mothership a lot in different studios, including East West, quite a lot at East West. Um, it's really cool for tracking in certain things. For mixing and print, I do not like it. And that's because I don't need to color that section. I also don't want to use something that's super clean. I do do a demonstration on that converter video. My favorite converter is Josh Florian's JCF converters. The reason why I like his stuff is because it is by far the most Sorry, musical. Sorry, stuff do you like? JCF audio. That's Josh Florian's converter. I, I, I have a couple of friends who have those and absolutely love those. Yeah, they're very, so I have 16 out and eight in. It's ridiculous. I know it, but it's, oh man, it makes me so happy because it really does. There's no electronics in the chain. There's a transformer, but you're not hearing the transformer. You're hearing what the music is doing. It's very, very open sounding. The Burl, it does this cool thing, but it's coloring in a way. And I talk about that where like for a kick drum, it's really neat. Or for a vocal, it's adding neat color if you need that color. So if you, let's say your vocal mic isn't doing exactly what you're wanting it to do, the burl would actually do really good at making it sound more colorful. Uh, but for me, I like to get that size thing. And I feel like I'm able to get that with JCF really well. Somebody's asking about the DW Fern. I'll give you my quick... 30 second on DW Therm. When you sit and talk to, to, to Doug, when you talk to him, it feels like you're great talking. Guy. Oh, he's a great guy. You feel like you're talking to like one of the engineers at Trident who's designing equipment that they want to use for their studio. Cause we all know that Trident produced those a range consoles because that's what the engineers wanted. And they were very specific and they wanted a certain sound and they wanted certain things. And that's Doug. He, he ended up, designing something that he wanted. So I think that's why I personally love the DW Fern stuff. I actually have always rent it or borrow it because I don't have enough spare money to buy it, but I should probably just buy something. Now, you, you're a user, aren't you? Yeah, I have a preamp, but I think the compressor is where I am the same with you. Like, oh, I got to get one. Yeah, preamp is outstanding. Nothing sounds like it. The DI is outstanding. Nothing sounds like it. Somebody asked earlier, 
about explain Bill Schnee's bass sound. Well, for me, I think a lot of it's his DI. No one makes his DI. This isn't a uh, Fern DI, but it's something different. But the Fern DI was one of the few DIs I heard that did something very similar to the, the DI that Dan Garcia and Bill Schnee, I believe Al Schmidt have. It's a very, very unique, very gorgeous, large sound. The preamp on the Fern going back to what we were talking about is super lush, super fast, super clean, but not like grace preamp clean or millennial preamp clean. It's like gorgeous. And it's almost high gain, like a mastering lab preamp where it just sounds enormous, thick. A two preamp, like a 610 is thick and dark and wooly sounding, but the fern is just Half of the reason why I like to use super gear is because it just makes it, I just lose all of my insecurities of like, okay, I know this is going to sound great no matter what, because I've used it in the past and it sounds unbelievable. The hard thing about not having a studio with a tracking capability anymore is that any new room I go into, I need to make sure that they have something similar. But if I'm putting up a bunch of tube microphones, half the time they don't sound anything like what I was hoping they sounded like or remembered mine sounding like or something like that so it's all about going and experimenting and hoping for the best because half the time things aren't maintained the, the right way because it just can't gear as an analog falls apart that's why apollo and these other companies um the, the microphone modeling companies are just getting better and better and making things really really cool because you don't have to deal with the other problems like the breaking down and such Paul, well, James is asking a very interesting, possibly contentious question. I don't want to get into brands and things like that, but he's asking about what we feel about clones. Um, I think the – what's the right way of putting this? I'm being delicate here. I think there's clones in electronics and then there's clones in look. And if you're going to ask me what I prefer – that I do like some clones. Um, you ask about BAE. I love BAE. And I would call that a clone in electronics. And I don't want to go any further than that. So, you know, I like, you, you, you know, um, there was a time that uh, the original owner of that company, Brent Averill, um, who unfortunately passed away, was it last year or earlier yeah. this year? Yeah. Um, last year, yeah. Um, Brent Averill um, would buy in the late 90s and the early 2000s would buy Neves, 1073s, 1081s, 1084s, and he would rebuild them, clean them up, recap them, and then resell them at a fairly affordable price when he first started off. And then, of course, you know, people asked him to then put them into 19-inch rack mounts. So then he went and found original transformers and etc. And that was like the birth of BAE, and the philosophy has always been built around making as close as humanly possible, depending on parts availability, exact copies. The reality is, is making exact copies of British-built 60s and 70s and early 80s gear is very expensive, and there's a reality in that. So they tend to be a bit more expensive. But it did open up this huge market for people wanting them. Why not? We all want Neve equipment. We all want API. So that opens up the look like the gear kind of equipment. And I think that there is some really good, inexpensive things. I'm a huge fan of 1176 clones. I feel like there's some inexpensive 1176 clones out there, which are unbelievable. And my personal opinion on that is I have electronics engineer friends, and they say to me, frankly, the components of 1176 are really cheap. So you shouldn't have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on a new original when you can actually get a clone, which is pretty darn close. But it's a hard question to answer because people get very upset if you aren't incredibly positive about every piece of equipment that was ever made. But um, for me, I feel like, and you can speak to this, Mark. In fact, I'll give you the floor while I, I've had too many cups of tea. I mean, it's tough. I don't want to talk about specific pieces of gear and any particular companies, but um, I feel like, I feel like I, I'm I'm neved out. I've got enough neves now. Yeah. I've got combination of neve gear. I've got BAE. I've got API. I've got BAEs, APIs, and I'm pretty darn happy. I'm 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 excited by companies like Tegler. I'm excited by I haven't talked about them in a while, but Wes Audio. 
Um, there's that louder than liftoff that I really want to try. I hear that guy is a genius. Um, you know, he designed, um, didn't he design the Clairphonic? I think he did or something. He was like an ex, ex, ex member of that. Um, you know, there's these guys and girls, people out there making interesting, new, exciting pieces of equipment. And I feel like if I'm going to find something maybe at a bargain price, I might want to try out some of those. You know, you know what I mean? Oh, I don't know. What do you think, Mark? Are you, do you have favorite pieces of gear that you just think are like incredible value for money? And just, I know we both like Tegler a lot. So that's amazing. Yeah. When I started, there wasn't a lot of clones too, you know, and I fell into the bandwagon of using the first uh, Brent A. Roll 1272 that was made off of original 1272 preamps and they sounded outstanding. And then there was Dan Alexander, who was very similar, went around and pulled parts. I had a 1272 preamp, two 1272 Dan Alexander preamps. Really good. Then I bought another one that was a complete clone of the original, and it was excellent. But then, you know, Bintec came out, and then all of a sudden you started seeing all these other Golden Ages, Heritage, uh phoenix all these companies just doing clones and half the time you just see a red knob that looks like a neve knob and you go okay that's that's looks like it does it sound like it same to say with fairchild same to say with la two a's and 1176s i would say that an la two a is special because of the transformer and the opto cell now the newer stuff, the opto cells are LED based versus a light bulb based, but there's certain opto cells that work really good. Some that don't sound anything like an original LA2A as well. I'm not a snob. I literally go for anything I can get sounding good. I literally have Black Lions B173 right here, and this is $400. And it sounds, I'm assuming it's based off of a 173. So it's 173. So it's a 1073 ish thing it's got stepped you can hear it stepped guy and i literally did acoustic guitar with it the other day with the tube mic and it sounded fantastic 400 dollars preamp so i think relative to that we are at a place now where we're not seeing a ton of specialness with somebody re-releasing a similar preamp but i do believe that everyone that's putting out stuff at some point is putting out something with a lot of quality there isn't anything garbage coming out now i feel that component wise it definitely seems to help so let me look at some other questions while warren is in the bathroom uh kahuna says something about special techniques with the two bus multi-banding compression I don't really go into there's two ways of multi-band i use one is my two bus multi-band I approach it where I'm just tapping every frequency band by half dB. And then the other one is as a plug-in, like a fab filter, I'm using that as a almost surgical dynamic EQ. And sometimes I use the fab filter EQ3's dynamic EQ or I'll use the multi-band and they similarly sound similar. And that just is like, okay, this acoustic guitar has a boominess at hundred Hertz. So I'm just gonna focus the multi-band on just that section. Yeah, in. Look who's back. <laughs> Did I throw you under the bus there for a few minutes? Yeah. I think <laughs> I might have to go take a, a quick. So you're going to have to run for a second. Yeah. Put me on a pause. Um, oh, Chad's asking about that. I haven't. You, you, you can we, you can put it on me for a few minutes if you have to use the, the bathroom. Yeah, yeah. I got to use the loo. You got to use the bowl. Here, I'll let Atticus talk to you guys. You, you got, yeah, let the, let the puppy. Uh, oh, look, he's getting up. He's getting up. He's like, where's my dad going? Oh, he's gone back to sleep. He's like, ah, whatever. So Chad's asking, uh, hey, Chad, I don't know if this was already answered by Mark. Is the Black Lion audio modded Apollo Twin good enough to run as a converter with new ATC 45S? Thanks, you too. I can ask um, Mark as well when he comes back. But first of all, the Apollo Twin sounds fantastic. And everything that I personally know about Black Lion audio is really amazing. I've never actually personally recorded with one. Um, but I have a lot of friends that love the mods that they do. Um, I remember 
um, going to um, Scott's studio before he died, you know, from Stone Temple Pilot, and they pilots and they had the black lion modded converters there and absolutely loved them and were making records with it. So I can tell you from that perspective that obviously if it's good enough to make albums that we all bought, then it's definitely good. And I think, you know, the Apollo twin actually starts off at a higher level than those old DigiDesign ones that were, you know, cause we're talking about the DigiDesign ones from the early two thousands that were, they were modding and making much, much better. I think the Apollo Twin is a far superior interface than a 20-year-old um, DigiDesign one. No disrespect to DigiDesign, because at the time, they were making really, really good stuff. You know, it was as good for the time. But I would say, yes, the Black Lion stuff would be rather wonderful. Um, yeah, I was talking about Black Lion. I have their B173 here, and it, it's great. Sounds great. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Somebody's saying now that Thanos is spanning. <laughs> well, he's just asking about VST instruments, uh, violins or pianos. For me, like VST pianos are pretty insanely good. Um, you'll never get the, it to sound like it's played as badly as a real piano player. <laughs> you know, because like we're talking about with, with piano performance, you know, the left and the right hand balance is such about, you know, uh, the player. You know, Isaac, for instance, is he he could not pianos out of tune. I think he's right handed. I'm sure he's right handed, but he plays the left hand like this, like comes down, like this. He'd be like he'd be like playing his right hand like this and then doing the left like that. So, you know, it would always be like, hey, because hey, uh, I think he was so used to, to tracking on his own. And probably because in a mix, you take the, the, the low end of the piano out, not entirely, but reduce it so that the bass guitar can live. So he was probably listening. Now I come to think of it with the piano I was giving him with a little bit of low rolled off from about 100 hertz and below. And he was probably playing it louder to make it feel more. So that's a good lesson for me. Next time I'm tracking a piano player, leave the low end in there so they play a little softer on the left hand. Amazing how we work this stuff out while we're talking about it. Um, but as far as violins and stuff like that with VST instruments, they can be great. It's tough with solo. Solo VST stringed instruments, pretty painful. I've heard some cellos that can work really well on single lines, but violins can end up sounding a little, you know, a little too... Perfect and There's, not expressive. Enough. I'll just say this because I deal with a lot of guys in composers working with fake synths. You can pull it off. It's possible to make it real. You just have to understand how to do it. I don't get it. It's like the mixing tricks and stuff. Um, I know guy composers that are using VST samples packs that everyone else are using that I get. And I literally asked where it was recorded. And it's all about the programming and understanding how to do the dynamics and the, the foot pedal thing that I've seen a couple guys do with kind of some of the dynamics and such like that. But it is doable. Same as fake drums. Now, there are plugins like the Soothe plugin or the, the uh, what, what, what do you call that? The Floss, Gloss, Gloff. Golfos. Golfos, that's great. They're a great company that does take some of that harshness out of these samples. But I, some, it's like ringing in some of the samples that I hear that I can't get out. Same as guitar uh, simulations and stuff. But it is getting better and better. And there are stuff where I just don't know if it's real or not. 100%. Right. Right. Well, fantastic. Um, I think we're, we're coming near the end of this. I think let's do a couple of, um, let's do, first of all, please hit the like button. It's absolutely fantastic. It's, seven, it's been over 700 people consecutively watching this. It's pretty, pretty wonderful. I appreciate you all. And of course, if you haven't already, check out the course. There is a link to it above here. So go and check out Mark's course. He is... Um, I'm looking at clockwise. So yeah. my stems go through its own universe. I clone my 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 stereo. Yeah. I think um the 
so what was I saying? Um, yeah, the um, Zantini, yes. Zantini, what is that? Tell me. Uh, Jay Zantini asked if 16 channels is enough. I said yes. I'm just commenting on these guys. I'm trying to get as many as I can before we have to go. So burning desires. What sort of burning desires can we do we have here? Anybody got some? Uh, Anita says she got here late, needed some more sleep. Hope you feel better. Um, uh, nasty, nasty sounds in high mids. Yeah, there's definitely some EQ tricks to get rid of that. Our friend Scott at Chernobyl Studios has a course called Guitar Tone Mastery. So if you go to Promix Academy, you can see his course. Look it up, Guitar Tone Mastery, and he talks about how to get amp sims to sound more realistic. Um, makes the uh, apparently you make the best YouTube tutorials. There you go. Congratulations. Wow. Thank you. Do, what do we think of merging technologies interfaces? Have you used them? Merging tech. What, say it again. Yeah, is it emerging te technologies interfaces? I think you, uh, I can't remember. I can't remember if I used it or not. So I don't. I try not to have opinions on things that I don't use. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know what that is. Yeah, I've, I've seen... alcohol does not ever help a mix. It <laughs> helps after a mix, but not during. No way does it ever help. Same as pot. Like no way. Yantho says, I've had an experience with a CAD um, et, et, EQ Tech E300. I think so. I've used some Is that CAD that the big stuff. giant thing? I don't know. It says it's, it had batteries leaked in it, so I, I don't know. I know there's some cheaper CAD. There's obviously originally CAD was like a super high-end. Um, e, I remember the BBC used to have some and everything, but I don't know the newer stuff. I know the newer stuff. I do, well, I did. I used I used a newer one. I think it was a ribbon as a mono room mic in Boston, and it was pretty amazing. Um, uh, I like CAD mics. Yeah. What's your uh, James is asking? What do you think of the best mix you've ever done? What are you most proud of mix wise? I would say Fleetwood Mac only because it's the song I grew up on. Like that album had my favorite Fleetwood Mac song on it, which was um, Gypsy. And I feel like it was the easiest mix I've ever done because it was so well recorded and so easy. And it was the funnest mix I ever, like I almost started crying when I was doing it. Um, there's a lot. I like a lot of stuff. But I hate 99% of everything I mix. I literally can't understand why I keep getting phone calls to work sometimes. Just because I get into these stumps and I'm just like, this isn't sounding great. But I'm getting closer to being consistent in my mind. And I think that's the key. But I've said this before. You don't want to arrive anywhere yet. You always want to grow into stuff. So I'm still going after my journey of how to get the best or try to get the best sound my this year's struggle is um, dealing with transients with volume. It's trying to be able to retain the transients I need with still making loud records. It's been really difficult trying to figure that out, even when it's mastered. Um, and maybe there's no way to do it, but that's my, my, my goal. Amazing. Yeah, lots of people love the uh, Gypsy mix. This has been fantastic. We've got three minutes and so we'll knock it on, on the head. Thank if Any burning desires, uh, please hit that like button um, and stay. Um, it's this channel, good fellow. Stay tuned for Mark. More Mark. What is the next one you're going to do? you going to do the converters? I think the next one is going to be pre-delay. Uh, okay, yeah, I've, a lot of people have asked about that. There's been a constant question about reverb pre-delay and then i think converters and then i think um tegler reverb oh yeah we and like then Mika Hull. there's a couple other cool little sneaky ones that i'll i'll have i'm planning i'm just trying to get my my focus i've, I've got to decide if i like this dark mode you can see it over here this Pro Tools dark mode, I'm going back and forth. Every other project I do, I'm in dark or the normal, dark and normal. My, see. All of my personal stuff on a phone and laptop I have on the dark mode just because I'm on it too often and I get headaches otherwise. 
So I don't know about Pro Tools. I'm not sure about that. I did, I've been had a headache the last couple of days. It will not go away. And we've been working quite a lot on this track. So maybe that's what it was. Have you, do you get headaches from working on yes, the screens? Yes. And my tinnitus is not traditional. It's like it messes up my vision. Mm. So if, then I know I'm mixing too loud if my vision gets all right. kooky. So you just got to take care of your eyes and your ears and breaks, super breaks. Get outside, be in the sun as much as you can for a bit and just take care of yourself. Amazing. So what do you think? We're going to do that pre-delay maybe next week? Pre-delay, yeah, next week. And then the converter one will come probably after that. Might as well get it out there. I've been delaying it for some reason. Paul, that guitar is a Gibson J160E. We talked about it earlier. So if you go back to the beginning of the video, we actually had a whole discussion on how to record it um, and all kinds of good stuff. Um, amazing. Well, I will see everybody in the Academy stream um, in about half an hour. I was hoping my lunch would be here because I ordered it over an hour and 15 minutes ago, but <laughs> apparently not. <laughs> Mark, it's been wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Talk to you guys soon. Appreciate it. Everybody check out Mark's course. If you click above there, it's mixing two Eric Burden songs. Yes, that's Eric Burden from The Animals and, of course, War. Another amazing band. So check it out. If you go to the top of the chat there, you can click on that link and it will take you to it. And uh, thanks, everybody. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing. Um, and we'll see you all again very soon. Thank you again, Mark. Bye. Thanks. So long. Farewell. Have a